Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep is the worst entry in the Kingdom Hearts franchise by far. All of the magic that the series once held in concept, character, story, and gameplay is lost. In their place is soullessness, boredom, and stupidity galore. Originally, this video was going to share in the naming convention of my other videos, taking lines that fit with the narrative or encapsulating my feelings toward the games. This video's title was supposed to be Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep Critique. Darkness is the heart's true essence. But no, just like this game, we're not going with subtlety or nuance. We're not going with meaning or themes or anything of the sort. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep is the worst Kingdom Hearts game in the entire series, and one of the worst games I've ever played. Not because it's broken or unplayable or it pissed me off, but because it has nothing of value to give me as a player. And to spoil the ending for you, this game is a 1 out of 10. Made for the PlayStation Portable, BBS was released in January of 2010 in Japan and September of 2010 in the rest of the world. It was marketed as both a prequel to the original Kingdom Hearts, as well as helping set up the eventual Kingdom Hearts 3. To this end, it introduces several concepts and characters, many of which will become relevant in future titles. Before we discuss any of that, however, we need to discuss this game's reputation. Among many fans, this game ranks very highly in their lists of the best Kingdom Hearts game, right up there with 1 and 2, which is what Nomura wanted, as he felt this game was as important to the series as a numbered entry. In many ways, this is the true follow-up to Kingdom Hearts 2. And to that I say, what a disappointing follow-up. In quite literally every single aspect, this game is far, far inferior to Kingdom Hearts 1 and especially Kingdom Hearts 2. Story, characters, Disney implementation, combat, exploration, everything. This game does exactly two things right that Kingdom Hearts 2 got wrong. First, it cuts out the gummy ship crap between worlds, so you can just jump from one to the next without pausing. Second, it gives you your movement options throughout the adventure instead of locking them behind drive forms, but that one comes with an asterisk. The asterisk is required movement options. For example, Terra gets high jump from a random chest because he never needs it to get through his storyline. Ventus also gets super glide from a chest, but he only gets regular glide in his story. Now, whoa, whoa. I gotta say, I'm losing the plot here. Who the hell is Terra, and why are you calling Roxas Ventus? These are questions we all asked upon first hearing about this game. So before we get too far into specifics, let's jump back from this tangent and into the story proper. To give the briefest and least nuanced overview ever, Birth by Sleep is the Star Wars prequels done much, much worse. And that comparison is actually more relevant than you might think, so just bear with me. In BBS, you follow three different characters, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua. Each is a Keyblade wielder training under Master Ericus. On one starry night, Aqua gives each of them a Wayfinder to represent their friendship, and the next day, Terra and Aqua take their Mark of Mastery exams to try and become fully-fledged Keyblade Masters themselves. In the end, Aqua succeeds, Terra fails, but both are sent on a quest to locate the missing Master Xehanort, who attended the exam and then disappeared. Ventus runs away after Terra leaves, and all three then travel to different Disney worlds to find Xehanort, each other, and peripherally to fight off the Unversed, I guess. Wait a minute, where are the heartless- never mind, we'll get there, I promise. So, all of that was wrong, right? This game is just off. To my mind, it's a combination of nostalgia baiting and trying to change far too much about the established lore at once. On the former, they almost word for word recreate the initial scene in Kingdom Hearts 1, where Sora wakes up from the dive to the heart dream, here in the tutorial section. And that's not even mentioning the Wayfinders being the good luck charm that Kyrie was making for Sora, the desire to go to other worlds, contemplating other worlds, etc. On the latter, buckle in because we have a lot to cover. First, why are there suddenly so many Keyblade wielders running around? In this game, there are six, with the Wayfinder trio, Masters Ericus and Xehanort, and Vanitas, who we will get to, trust me. Oh, you know, and there's also Mickey Mouse, the mascot, but eh. In Kingdom Hearts 1, there were two Keyblades, one from the Realm of Light, wielded by Sora, and one from the Realm of Darkness, wielded by Mickey. 
In Kingdom Hearts 2, Riku now uses a Keyblade, presumably from the realms in between, as he operates in between light and darkness. That's his whole thing. That was every Keyblade. People seem to be able to briefly gift others a Keyblade, such as when Sora gives it to Jack Sparrow, or when Riku gives one to Kairi so she can defend herself in the world that never was, but those outliers seem to be just that, the other characters borrowing existing Keyblades. Same deal in 358 Days Over 2, Roxas uses Sora's Keyblade as his nobody, and Shion simply copies it. Immediately, this game throws that lore out the window. Now, the only thing you need to become a Keyblade wielder is... Well, I don't know, because they never establish it. In this game alone, there are three different explanations. You can have the ability passed down to you from a current Keyblade wielder, your heart could meld with a Keyblade wielder and gain it that way, or you could have a magic charm placed on you by a Keyblade wielder. Though that last one is debatable, as Aqua never really explains what the charm does in detail, just that it will keep Kyrie safe. In addition, there's the Keyblade Graveyard location, the site of the Keyblade War, which... Yeah, see above, why are there so many Keyblades? How? This doesn't make sense with what was established before. As well, now there's a test to determine who's a master and who's not? Why? How was this test established and by who? Where were Ericus and Xehanort during this supposed Keyblade War? How long ago was the Keyblade War? Why did Yen Sid give being up a master? How? Can he no longer wield the Keyblade? And if so, why not? If there's a test, who determines it? Part of the test was pitting Terra and Aqua against each other in a fight, which was hilarious by the way, because 20 seconds earlier, Ericus explicitly stated that this was not a competition between them, only to have them directly compete with each other in combat. Anyway, what if only one of them was worthy to take the test? What would it entail then instead of the duel? If the test isn't standardized to some degree to even out the playing field, then by definition it's arbitrary, both the test itself and whatever credentials Ericus is going off of that made Terra and Aqua qualify, but not Ventus. Which is made even more confusing in gameplay, as though the trio all play slightly differently, none of them are clearly the best or strongest character to play as. Getting back to the main point, if it's arbitrary, why does the exam exist, and why are non-masters excluded from knowledge? Spoilers, we don't ever learn explicitly what that excluded knowledge is, even playing Aqua's story, who is privy to it. The only time the game references anything of the sort is in the final episode after you beat all three characters' individual stories, at which point the only knowledge that we can assume was passed down was how to turn the Land of Departure world into Castle Oblivion which that is so specific so why would that need to be hidden whatever if a wielder fails the test enough times or causes trouble can they be kicked out of the class so to speak if so what happens then can they still use the keyblade if so again what's the point of the mark of mastery thing and the teacher student relationship if they can't if they're kicked out how can you take away someone's ability to use a keyblade isn't it based on their strength of heart or whatever if the whole teacher student relationship was an unofficial thing where it's just a silent agreement between two parties such as with goku training with king kai and dragon ball i would have no problem with the mark of mastery because then it's just a determination of yes i have nothing left to teach you you are my equal kind of thing however because it is official and knowledge is supposedly withheld from non-masters and it's this big deal that keyblade wielders specifically trained for years to undertake i need to know all of these specifics for me to buy it if you're going to introduce something this stupid you need to justify it to me i actually thought of a solution for this problem while writing this part of the script what if Ericus grants a chosen few the ability to borrow a Keyblade, like Riku did with Kairi in Kingdom Hearts 2? He could only maintain this power within this small world of the Land of Departure, which explains why Terra, Ventus, and Aqua have never left, though they had to come from somewhere, which is a whole other can of worms. But back to the topic at hand. The training that these borrowers undergo is building the strength of heart necessary to make their borrowed Keyblade stay with them, even at the call of its original owner. Thus, the first step of the Mark of Mastery exam would be that the Master would try and take the Keyblade back, and if it stays with the pupil, then they can move on. And if not, if the Keyblade answers to the original wielder's call, then the pupil obviously isn't ready to continue. I thought of a way that there could be multiple Keyblades as well, similar to what will be explained somewhere in future titles, and explain why Yen Sid is no longer a master. So spoilers, Xehanort is trying to recreate the Keyblade. Yes, they say it like that. 
For the sake of accessibility, I'll refer to it as the Kai Blade for the duration of the video. So, the Kai Blade is this mysterious but all-powerful Keyblade that Xehanort, as the villain, is trying to create as part of his master plan. He explains that the Keyblade War was fought over possession of the Kai Blade and that it was destroyed. Well, what if instead of being destroyed, it was splintered? Instead of the series eventually explaining that through researching the Kai Blade, people figured out how to summon incomplete replicas of it, which is the explanation for why there are so many Keyblades suddenly in existence, what if they wielded its fragments and those were the Keyblades that everyone wielded in the past, you know, in the Keyblade War? So the reason for the Keyblade War was to kill Keyblade wielders and assemble their Keyblades into an incomplete Kai Blade until it regains its full power. By the end, most of the Kai Blade condensed into two people's blades, Ericus and Xehanort's. In the past, Xehanort used his superior power to threaten Ericus, so Ericus could go to Yen Sid and be like, yo, this dude just rocked my shit, I need the juice. So Yen Sid then gives Ericus his Keyblade and the power that comes along with it, hence why he can't use the Keyblade anymore. Then, with every Keyblade wielder out of commission by the end of this game, the Keyblade partially reforged, creating the Keyblade from the Realm of Light, the Realm of Darkness, and the Realms in Between. Though the one from the Realm of Darkness obviously wouldn't be made until after Xehanort succumbs to the Darkness and becomes Ansem and Zemnis, but you know, whatever. Lore stuff, boring anyway, moving on. It would explain why Xehanort wanted the Final Clash to be in the Keyblade Graveyard too, as he would then use those splinters of the Keyblade to try and reforge it or something. Those two changes, I think, would greatly help the game connect to its earlier entries. The good thing about them is that it wouldn't even really require much reworking to make it happen. At the most, change some dialogue and tweak the Mark of Mastery. Done. But the ultimate question, bigger than any of the technicalities that I just went over, is... Why should we care? If the game isn't going to properly explain all of this stuff to us, surely it must be using the time to draw us into the characters and their personal journeys, right? Uh, no. The Wayfinder Trio f***ing blows. Okay, sorry, sorry. But really, this is the trio we're focusing on for this game? Do you guys remember Kingdom Hearts 2 in the world that never was when Sora and company confront Zigbar and he says something to the effect of you're not half the hero the others were? Well, as we learn in this game, the Wayfinder Trio are those other heroes. Really? Really. That's like comparing the original trilogy to the sequel trilogy. We're told it's so much bigger and better, but what it shows us is the complete opposite in terms of craft and creativity. If I have to start positive, I really like their design mentalities. Except for Terra's pants. You know, how they're half armored and they explode into armor in a flash of light. That's really cool. Unfortunately, the positives stop there when it comes to how they look. I don't care what the in-universe justification is for Ventus looking like Roxas. I don't like it. I hate that they reuse this design that we all like and make it worse by cluttering it up with the armor underneath the shirt, armored boots and shoulder pad, the cross across the chest, and the splitting the jacket between light and dark. It's just so stupid. As I said before, Terra's pants are awful. Enough said on that. That leaves Aqua as the only one to get off scot-free for me. Number one, she's a babe and a distant number two, everything else. I love the fingerless gloves, I love how practical the garments are so they don't get in the way of her fighting while still remaining feminine and flowy. I love the two-layer top, it's just all great. And dude, look at the absolute territory. As for their voices, wow, I don't know what the hell happened here. What else is darkness but hate and rage? Xehanort is feeding the dark fires within you, making you fight. You'll go astray again. The thing is, I know for a fact it's not the actor's fault, at least not completely. All three of the trio's voice actors, Jason Doring, Jesse McCartney, and Willa Holland, have put in fantastic performances elsewhere. I'm nearly 100% sure that the blame lies with whoever was directing them as they recorded their lines, and unfortunately I couldn't find a specific name for that. For those that don't know, voice acting, especially in games, is done without knowing what the finished product will look like, at least most of the time. It's up to the voice director to provide context for the lines being delivered. And this is also a Japanese game. Now I don't know about games per se, but in anime, an English voice actor will watch the clip with the Japanese voice, read their line, and try to match the timing and lip flaps as best they can. I imagine some weird combination of these two things is happening in Birth by Sleep, and it just failed in this case. 
Let's look at the scene where the Wayfinder trio are given their Wayfinders. Pay attention to Aqua's voice. Notice how unnatural it sounds with its inflection, and how it feels like Willa Holland isn't quite sure when the line is supposed to end sometimes, or even what emotion she's supposed to convey, with lines like, Somewhere out there, there's this tree with star-shaped fruit. And, You will always find your way back to each other. And, But I did the best with what I had. And, an unbreakable connection. At least the last line, doesn't it sound like it should end down? Like, an unbreakable connection. Instead of her voice going up and just kind of hanging there with no resolution. And Willa Holland gives a more credible performance in later games with better voice directors. So again, it's not just her fault. The only ones to come out of this shit fest mostly unscathed are the veteran voice actors like Jesse McCartney and Mark Hamill as Ericus. But those aside, my god, there's almost nothing right. And it would be one thing if this was just an isolated incident in this opening scene, but the issues in this clip continue throughout the game, from basically beginning to end. Though strangely, it does get a little bit better as it goes on. Don't get me wrong, it never becomes good for any longer than a few minutes at a time, but it stops being laughably bad like those opening cutscenes. It almost feels like they recorded the lines linearly from start to finish. And that really sucks, because these are the single most important scenes in the entire game, as they're what's supposed to get you invested in the Wayfinder trio as a unit to make you feel bad about how they all lose in the end. To speak about the trio as a whole, as characters, I would call them bad Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, the comparison is really obvious, so much so that I don't really want to make it, but here we go, it's kind of impossible to do. Obviously Xehanort is the Emperor, and Terra is Anakin who ultimately turns to the dark side, but Ventus is also Anakin. Terra is the pupil that turns to the dark side, and Ventus is the weapon that Xehanort wants to use to win, just as Anakin filled both roles in the prequels. Meanwhile, Aqua serves as our Obi-Wan, a person who is technically in a position of authority, but more or less comes across as an equal to our resident Anakins. Ericus serves as our Mace Windu, Yen Sid our Yoda of sorts, and so on and so forth. So here's the rub. The fall of Anakin Skywalker was a multi-generational and multifaceted issue that is extremely complex and nuanced. To get a small taste of what I mean, I urge you all to look up Dave Filoni on the Star Wars prequels, but it goes much deeper than that. Meanwhile, the fall of the Wayfinder trio is not. The key thing to take away from the Star Wars prequels is that it was not just Anakin's fault that he became Darth Vader. It was everyone's fault. Qui-Gon's death in Episode 1 is the pivotal turning point and crushed Anakin's only chance of staying on the light side of the Force. He's left with a brother figure that originally didn't even want to bring him aboard their ship, comparing him to Jar Jar, a wife who he's forced to hide his love for, a mother killed by the negligence and brutality of the world and those in power, the Jedi Council who are so prideful and blind that they don't notice the Emperor right there as Palpatine, and who are so afraid of the prophecy and so unconfident in Anakin as a Jedi that they insult him by not giving him the rank of Master even though he's clearly earned it by saving the Chancellor basically single-handedly from a Sith Lord. And, to top it all off, he's been getting visions of his wife dying along with his unborn child. All of these factors did contribute to Anakin's fall, along with the most important part, his lust for power. The key point at which he chose to pursue knowledge of the dark side of the Force was when Palpatine told him the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, and the power to stop people from dying. In the end, despite all of that other stuff, the most important factor was Anakin's own flaws as a person. He was obsessed with gaining power for what he believed with all of his heart to be a just cause, to make the galaxy a better place. Now, let's look at Birth by Sleep. Oh, Xehanort just orchestrated everything. Every single bad thing that happened to the trio was because of Xehanort in one way or another, except for exactly one time when Terra's darkness popped up and caused him to arbitrarily fail the Mark of Mastery exam. Yes, Terra would have probably been driven away from his friends anyway when he learned of Aqua spying on him for Ericus, but by the end of his Disney World visits, he's pretty much ready to go back to them and make up. It's only because of Xehanort's lies and manipulation that he falls after that. Likewise, it's Xehanort's fault that Ventus is the way he is, directly, having fractured his heart in the first place, creating Vanitas and the Unversed by proxy, and causing all of the problems dealing with them. If Ventus wasn't the way he was, Ericus wouldn't have tried to kill him, which means Terra wouldn't have had to rely on his dark power to protect him, which means he wouldn't have fallen. And Aqua 
I mean, everything with her is caused by the mess the other two make, so the point stands. Having Xehanort be the be-all and end-all cause of everything bad in the story does a couple of things. First, it makes Xehanort by far the most important character in the story, which is simply wrong. The protagonists should be the most important by far. But the most interesting? Sure, that's the Joker from The Dark Knight, or Rudolph from Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Valentia, but never the most important. That, by default, makes them the protagonist. The protagonist is the character that all of the events in the story revolve around. This is why Thanos is the protagonist of Infinity War, and so on. Batman doesn't become Batman because of the Joker, but the other way around. You feel me? Second, it takes away all agency from our three main characters. Yes, they technically make decisions and stuff, but every choice feels hollow with someone like Xehanort around. It feels much less like everything just happened to work out for the old coot, which is exactly what happened by the way, and more like he calculated everything that would happen from the start or even years in advance. Fundamentally, just as with the Star Wars prequels, this is a story about how everyone except for the villain loses. This is called a tragedy, and it's been used many times throughout all of history. The Star Wars prequels, Crisis Core, Fate Zero, etc. In each of these titles, one core theme permeates. The characters didn't deserve their fate. In Crisis Core, Zack was gunned down not because of a personal flaw, but because it's just business. He was a loose end that needed to be tied up. In the prequels, the Jedi fall... Well, I guess we already went over that. In Fate Zero, the noble characters lose because they assumed that the Holy Grail War would be fought fairly. Tosaka loses because of his ego blinding him to Kirei's shifting loyalties. Kiritsugu loses because he lacked the scope to understand the true nature of the Grail before it was too late, etc. Each of these characters in each of these stories had plenty of flaws, but nothing to make us think they really deserve to die or fail, other than mild negligence in Tosaka's case. And I could go on for countless other tragedies, and that's certainly how it's framed in Birth by Sleep, but I'm not so sure I'd buy it. Let's look at a scene near the end of Terra's story. Terra is in subspace and sees a light that he senses is Ventus. He's ready to meet his friends again with a newfound resolve to protect them after his visit to Destiny Islands and after he went through all of his Disney worlds. But instead of following him, he goes to where Xehanort calls him. There, Xehanort tells him, uh, yeah, Ventus figured out who he is and is going to rough up Ericus, I guess. Terra, like an idiot, goes, okay, I believe you, and rushes off. That's how we get the equivalent of Anakin cutting off Mace Windu's hand and turning to the dark side, complete with the what have I done after the fight with Ericus. Terra, why are you this dumb? Wouldn't it raise huge red flags as to how Xehanort knows this information? He says that Ventus stumbled across it, but to know that, he would have had to have been there. And that Terra didn't immediately question this tells me two things. One, he's an idiot and deserves everything that's coming to him. And two, the writers didn't bother doing a second draft because otherwise they probably would have caught this. Thanks, Nomura. Likewise, Ventus is so childish and unengaging as a character that I simply don't care about anything that happens to him. In a sentence, he's everything I don't like about Sora, but about 10 years younger in maturity. In the beginning, he hears the bell summoning the Wayfinder trio, and as he's running out, a boy in a mask starts talking mad shit about Terra. So, instead of immediately telling this guy to get out or actually pushing to get some information about him, Ventus just listens to what he has to say, goes, okay, I believe you, and proceeds to watch him leave through a dark portal. Because none of that was shady at all, right then? This conversation is the entire catalyst for Ventus running away and going on his journey, along with Terra just flat out refusing to explain why he's leaving to an obviously distressed Ventus, which is also really stupid. Again, Terra is terrible. And as for Aqua, I mean, she's the direct cause of the heartless and nobodies invading the world by foolishly sending Terra Xehanort back into the Realm of Light while she falls to the Realm of Darkness, which directly leads to the creation of Ansem Seeker of Darkness and Xemnas. If that doesn't mean she deserves to lose, then I don't know what would. The issue with that scene is that the game frames it as a noble act, because more than ever this game is obsessed with the concept of friendship. To be clear, it's not interested in portraying a realistic friendship, just constantly saying how deeply and strongly the Wayfinder trio are connected. So you see, it's actually a really good thing that Aqua does this, because she knows that in a way, she's saving Terra, so it's all good and is 100% justified, even though this decision almost leads to the destruction of the world, not once, but twice. Good job, Aqua. 
To add on top of my issues with the characters being stupid and making huge moral and logical errors consistently is their vagueness. Continuing on the idea that this was a first draft, or even closer to an outline than anything, nobody tells anybody anything among the heroes. Terra doesn't tell Ven why he's leaving, even though it isn't even a secret, because Ventus was called to that meeting too, where he got his assignment. By the way, this is the main reason that Ventus leaves, and all three are set out onto their respective quests. Great. This means that the only reason that the plot happens the way it does is because heroes are so secretive. And it's not just this one instance. Throughout the entire adventure, the only reason that the plot happens the way it does is because the heroes are so secretive and vague about everything that they do that all it takes is a little bit of bullshit from Xehanort to kick everything into high gear. Instead of helping Terra understand and control the darkness within him, Ericus just says, you got darkness, piss off, resulting in Terra turning to Xehanort who actually encourages him. Instead of explaining what Ventus is so that he understands why everyone is being so protective of him, they refuse and he has to have a traumatic flashback instead. Instead of Aqua saying, hey, Master Ericus wanted me to keep an eye on you to make sure you didn't get the wrong idea by him failing you, it comes out that she was spying on him suddenly and he sulks off without listening to the explanation. When nobody tells each other anything about why they do the things that they do, let alone tell the audience this, it makes it feel like the writers themselves didn't know or didn't care about the minutia either. And that feeling is prevalent throughout every aspect of the game, not just the script, but let's keep things focused for now. It felt like Nomura gave the writers a complete outline, and then they added dialogue robotically to the scenes without asking for clarification or any detail, because they sure as hell don't give us anything of the sort. It's the little things, like why doesn't Terra tell Ventus where he's going in the beginning? Or why doesn't Aqua force Fen to come home if she has the power to do so? Or what is darkness in the context of birth by sleep? These kinds of questions are ones that some writers like to gloss over for the sake of completing the first draft as it's much easier for some to go back and fill in gaps than it is to come up with everything linearly as you write. In my experience, a lot of writers work this way. The issue is that this is a game and games aren't allowed time for a second draft. This is why most game stories are so full of these contrivances and inconsistencies, stretching all the way back to old school PC RPGs. The reason why the mainstream media doesn't respect game stories as much as movie or book stories is that they tend to be of lower quality in terms of dialogue and plotting, and lack any amount of subtext that these other mediums revel in. In addition to the issue of the minutia as mentioned previously, all of these aspects are added to the initial idea in further drafts of the story. To be fair, once in a blue moon you get a series like Uncharted or the Telltale games that heavily emphasize the dialogue as a key selling point, but beyond that, you get a lot of mediocrity, and Birth by Sleep is at the lowest possible echelon of that mediocrity. Combined with the general awkwardness of the Kingdom Hearts series in terms of sound mix and dialogue editing, the awful voice direction, and the lackluster script even when looking away from its core issues, we're stuck with a story that has no redeeming values in my opinion. My friend Ian Waffle said it best on a call that we had. There's nothing to latch onto with these characters other than the baseline empathy of feeling bad for them because of what they go through. The only moral that the game gives is, man, going to hell, getting body swapped, and falling into a coma really sucks. I hope these characters don't have to deal with that anymore. And trust me, gameplay does not fare much better, but we'll get into that atrocity later. Believe it or not, all of what you heard before now is just set up. From here, we can actually look at Birth by Sleep as a game and as a story, content with the standards we've set. We are now expecting absolutely nothing from this game. What does it then have to offer? Well, there's not one, not two, but three playable characters, each with their own combat styles and specialities. Terra is the slow heavy hitter, Ventus is the fast guy with the reverse grip, and Aqua is the magic specialist. As well, each character follows their own story. You'll get a completely different experience playing through Terra's story compared to Ventus's and Aqua's, including what attacks you can use, bosses you'll fight, and areas you'll explore. This is something that the game was heavily marketed on. We're not getting one game, we're getting three complete games, and yeah, that was a total lie and we were fools for believing it. Compared to the breadth of the other entries in the Kingdom Hearts series, each individual character's stories are not only dissatisfying narratively, but are all pitifully short. Because I left the game on at several points so that I could cry at how bad it is, my playtime is fairly bloated, but even then, I beat Ventus's story in less than 10 hours, in a single session I might add, and Terra's not much longer than that, if longer at all. Aqua is a bit more bloated because she's who I decided to 100% the game with, but even then, I mean, come on. 
Sure, I was able to get to the final boss of Kingdom Hearts 1 in under 20 hours on the highest difficulty, and there's even a trophy for beating it in under 15, I believe, but I also know that game like the back of my hand. I know significantly less about Birth by Sleep in that I haven't played any character story to completion in over 5 years at this point, so if I went back and played the stories again after just doing these playthroughs, they should take even less time than before. And let's not forget that you can't just play one character story, oh no, that's not how this game works. Every character's narrative is intertwined with the other two, so to understand the full scope of what's actually going on, you're forced to play all three separately, one at a time. It absolutely sucks to finish Terra's story by itself. Why? Terra's body gets possessed by Xehanort, the lingering will beats the possessed body, kneels down, fades to black, credits. There's no resolution for Ventus or Aqua, no finding out what happened to the unconscious body of Terra, nothing. Just black. Go play Aqua's story to find out. Because of this, you're not playing three separate games, you're playing one game where it resets your power level and changes your playstyle at the one and two third completion marks. Each character's story is split into two halves, separated by their conjoined visit to Radiant Garden. In the first half, Terra is on a quest to find the missing Master Xehanort, only to learn from him that the Unversed, the enemies that you've been fighting, appear in worlds that a boy in a mask named Vanitas goes to, and so Terra is now trying to track him down. Xehanort continually pushes Terra to tap into his innate dark power powers, and he's exploited at several points throughout his journey, namely by Hades in Olympus, Captain Hook in Neverland, and most importantly, Maleficent in Enchanted Dominion, who forcibly controls Terra using the darkness within him and forces him to steal the Princess Aurora's heart. And as a quick side note for Kingdom Hearts nerds, you might be mistaken for thinking that this act is why Maleficent has Aurora captured and without a heart in Kingdom Hearts 1, but you'd be wrong. Ventus retrieves Aurora's heart, and Aqua helps Prince Philip in defeating Maleficent, as in the movie. It's later, at some indeterminate time between Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep and Kingdom Hearts 1, that Aurora is re-killed to set the events of Kingdom Hearts 1 into motion. Anyway, when Terra travels to Radiant Garden and learns of Aqua's spying and Ericus's distrust of him, he cuts ties with Ventus and Aqua and proceeds to search for Vanitas alone, Again, because Aqua was never looking for him. As well, he has to quote-unquote save Xehanort from a man named Brag, whose savvy fans will know eventually becomes the nobody called Zigbar. During this encounter, Terra uses his dark powers willingly for the first time and is rightfully disturbed by it. From there, Terra is in a funk, no longer having people that he can rely on and constantly having to tiptoe around the darkness in his heart, until he happens upon Destiny Islands and meets a young Riku. During this conversation, Terra's resolve to protect his friends is restored, and he finds himself wanting to see them again, hopeful that things will work out. In subspace, he sees a light that he believes is Ventus, only to be called by Xehanort, which we've already gone over. Terra, of course, takes everything Xehanort says at face value, and rushes back to the land of departure to find Ericus about to strike Ventus down, for reasons unknown to the player if this is their first story, which is all but intended. Terra once again taps into his dark power and bests Ericus, who admits that he was acting hastily. Before a true reunion could occur, Ericus is struck down in his weakened state by Xehanort, who then reveals his plan, to steal Terra's body using the darkness in his heart as some kind of conduit for his own essence, as well as to use Ventus and Vanitas to reforge the Kai Blade and unlock the secrets of Kingdom Hearts. Terra pursues him to put a stop to his evil plan, and is joined by Ventus and Aqua. In the end, however, Terra succumbs to the darkness inside of him, and though he defeats Xehanort in combat, the old bastard successfully takes control of Terra's body. The Lingering Will then kicks his ass so hard that he falls unconscious, and from there, the credits roll with no fanfare. The core flaw of every character's story is the lack of forward momentum. You could argue that Kingdom Hearts 2 suffered from this as well, but I feel like that was intentional, and once again my buddy Ian Waffles is going to have a great video on the subject coming out shortly. In brief, and trying not to ape a point off of him, Kingdom Hearts 2 uses its slower first half to lull the player into a false sense of security before the massive gut punch twist at the end of the Hollow Bastion 2 visit, where it's revealed that you were helping the organization the whole time by killing so many Heartless. There is no such twist or justification for the sluggish pace found in any of Birth by Sleep's three stories. Instead, we're left with... Generic Disney Adventures. Actually, not even generic, because at least generic could be misconstrued as charming, like the interactions in, I don't know, Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2 or something. These interactions are horrible. 
The thing about Kingdom Hearts 1 is that it is also as terrible as this. Sora barely actually interacts with the different Disney characters, save for a select few fun little moments. However, that game still works, and most of that is because of the Disney Villain Council. Without their interactions and role in the plot, that game might be even worse than this one. As is… wow. Of course, every character suffers from the janky voice direction, dialogue editing, and lackluster script, but beyond that, in terms of the amount of time you spend with each Disney character with the Wayfinder trio, well, in total, it equals about the same amount of time as in Kingdom Hearts 2's first visits, but that had a single protagonist that was building or reaffirming connections with his friends. In Birth by Sleep, we have three separate characters, so we have to meet the Disney characters three separate times and attempt to build connections with them, once again, three separate times. With the runtime split up like this, it leaves next to no room for actual development of these relationships, with some barely interacting at all with anyone, such as Terra barely meeting Snow White, or Ventus never meeting the evil stepmother in Cinderella World. Terra probably gets off the best overall, which is both surprising and a little bit sad, but he is still not anywhere close to good or consistent. And before you get all up in a tizzy, like, oh, they didn't have enough time, don't blame the writing. Well, you don't need a whole lot of time to tell good stories. Indulge me for a second as I jump over to the Fire Emblem franchise. In that game, there are usually like three characters that matter to the story. Your lord, your villain, and a secondary protagonist. Usually an avatar or a retainer, or maybe another lord. That's it. No one else actually matters. And yet, you have this massive cast of characters that everyone says are great, fully realized people, and this all comes from the support system. Without getting too detailed, two characters can have between two and five support conversations between each other as they grow more affection for each other in gameplay. And that's all that these people have. Outside of these support conversations, these guys are just plot devices and gameplay elements. However, for all the system's faults, these support conversations are effective in fleshing out the world and characters, and succeed in giving us actual arcs and meaningful themes, which Birth by Sleep routinely fails at. To give an example, let's look at Ford from Sacred Stones. He's a knight of the Kingdom of Rene and retainer to Prince Ephraim alongside his childhood friend Kyle, and they join up alongside Princess Erica and her growing army, where his younger brother Franz is serving, to push back the invaders of Rene. Ford is regarded as simultaneously one of the best and worst knights in the kingdom, because while he has immense talent and skill, he routinely slacks off in favor of acting the fool, or flirting, or napping, or indulging in his hobby of painting, even during battles. But as we read his support conversations and see different sides of him, we start to understand why he acts the way that he does, and why specifically he paints so often, and even why he paints what he does. His father was a knight before him and was killed in the line of duty, while his mother fell to illness around the same time and while Franz was just a child, forcing him to take on the parental role of his younger brother and to provide for him. Franz never understood why their father was away so much while he was on duty, so he often cried. It was only when Ford showed him a painting of their mother and father that Franz stopped crying, which led to Ford to continue painting, which his mother noticed. When Ford beat Kyle in a sword fighting competition, quote, she seemed far more pleased at a picture I'd drawn of her than at my victory. She rejoiced more in my skill with the brush than in my skill with the sword. I never understood why, not until recently at any rate. As we read his support conversations with Ephraim and Erica, we come to understand that reason alongside Ford. Both of them are at first confused and or annoyed by Ford's penchant for painting during battle, but each eventually comes to understand why he does so when they look upon the landscape he made and think about what it represents. Ephraim is often memed upon by the Fire Emblem community for being a big dumb brute who does nothing but wreck face with a lance, but his support with Ford offers a deeper understanding about what this war means to him and what his ultimate goal entails, and this applies to Erica as well. Winning the war and descending the throne isn't enough for either of them. Ephraim wishes to see Ford's painting one more time to remind him of the land as it once was before it was ravaged by this war, and Ford gives it to him as a gift. Ford's painting helps Ephraim put to words his true goal, to restore Renee's past beauty. Meanwhile, Ford directly asks Erica what she'll aim for after the war is over, and she says that she wants to help the people recover and regain their happiness, likening Ford to fighting for the same reason, and that's why he acts the fool so often, to make others smile even in the face of sorrow, because he knows firsthand what losing people can do, especially to children. Her words move Ford enough to make him restate his vows as a knight. 
to restore that radiant smile to your own lovely face, which fits with his flirtatious persona and as a genuine vow from a knight to his lady. And as one last piece of icing on the cake, it's mentioned a few times that Ford exclusively paints landscapes, and that the reason for this is because he can't bring himself to draw portraits because the last one he drew was of his mother before her death. And yet, because of the beauty he sees in Erica's dream, he says, I fight to see her smile again, to drive the worry from your face. If I can do that, then I will be more than happy to paint your portrait. To reiterate and to elaborate, Ford has no part to play in the plot save for his introduction. He doesn't appear in any cutscenes past that point, and he isn't even that fun to use since his growth rates suck. However, they injected him with so much care and nuance and love in those 12 conversations that I have all of this to say about him, and he remains one of my favorite characters in the series. And they still left room to show him acting the fool and messing with people with his three support conversations with Vanessa. Jumping back over to Kingdom Hearts, we get nothing of the sort. None of the main characters have a single piece of meaningful conversation between them in any of the three stories. They constantly say that they're great friends, but they don't share common interests, they don't talk to each other, and they don't have any chemistry whatsoever. Of course, to fix any of this, an easy way would be giving the main characters an actual backstory. Like, Sora didn't have much, but he's also a much simpler character than Terra Ventus and Aqua are supposed to be. At least that's what he started out as. So tell me why he has a more sound backstory than basically anyone in the Wayfinder trio. Just, there's a really simple question that I'd like to ask of Birth by Sleep, and the answer doesn't have to be complex at all, and there doesn't need to be any specifics, but here goes. Where were Terra, Ventus, or Aqua born? Does a character need to have this answer to be a quote-unquote real character? No. However, paired along with a plethora of other basic questions like who are their parents, how did they get to the land of departure, and how did Ericus find them, lead to one thinking that the writers didn't actually care about this story. Because don't you think, if they did care, that they would care enough about their original characters to think about this? Akira Toriyama is a writer that I don't particularly like, especially in recent years, but he did exactly what Kingdom Hearts does a thousand times better than it, which is introducing new shit at the 11th hour constantly and with no plan. Kingdom Hearts' MO is to reveal absolutely nothing about any of the characters, but establish their current persona, and then retcon established lore without actually adding to any character in any meaningful way. What Toriyama does is give just enough backstory to make the characters believable, and then fill in the blanks with information that's vague enough to be reasonably retconned later, but specific enough to actually add something to the plot and characters. Case in point, the Saiyans. In the olden days, this wasn't a problem for Kingdom Hearts, because it didn't have lore that was too firmly established to make the retcons unbearable. It also got around the issue of backstory and characters by showcasing those characters throughout the game and reinforcing their core values time and again. However, starting in Birth by Sleep, they stopped doing that second thing, and by now, the lore is firmly established, and they change all of it anyway. Nothing worthwhile is shown in any of the Disney worlds. Terra is an idiot throughout their run, has no kind of charisma to his name or rapport with any of the characters he meets, barely has a conversation with most of them, and at the end of the day, we learn next to nothing about him. His strongest showing in the Disney worlds isn't even toward a Disney character. It's Zack Fair from Crisis Core who appears on Olympus. I mean, he's controlled by Maleficent, he kind of half goes along with the Evil Queen, has no connection to Snow White, kinda has a decent thing going with Cinderella, even though it's extremely rushed to occur within two and a half scenes, an introduction, a half where Tara offers to escort her to the ballroom, and then the end when he learns a lesson, sort of. In the second half of the worlds, he's tricked by Hades, tricked by Captain Hook, tricked by the scientist from Lilo and Stitch, and has two scenes with the Disney crew in Disneytown, one introducing him to Chippendale, and then the two praising Terra for winning a race he didn't even enter in order to win just to kill on first. Once again, his single strongest showing is with Zack, as I said before. But again, that's just one scene. If we're being real though, Rick Gomez has so much energy and conviction in his voice that he single-handedly makes Olympus in this game. In Terra's story, once he's freed from Hades' control, Zack explains to Terra that he's a hero not because of himself, but because the people around him have deemed him to be one, before the two share a moment where they want to rematch each other in a fair fight. This interaction is one of the few in the game that come off as somewhat natural, and I found that Jason Doring as Terra sounds his best when he's playing to the more moody emotions. This is seen here, and especially when he's on Destiny Islands. 
In a rare bit of praise for this game, that whole scene is so well done compared to the rest of the adventure that I'm sure it was written and directed by a completely different team. The voice acting, dialogue, and scene direction are all excellent, from Terra seeing juxtaposing visions of an older Riku and young Xehanort, to tying in Riku's questioning of Terra's origins with his desire to see the outside world from Kingdom Hearts 1. The only thing I don't like is when Terra does the Keyblade passing down ritual thing, but we've already gone over how bad the game's retconning of lore is, so I won't go into it here. And then of course, we have his ending. A lot of the initial scene is rehashed footage from the Birth by Sleep secret ending of Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, like shot for shot, save for that the Wayfinder trio don't have capes in-game because the PSP probably couldn't handle cape physics. I mean, just look at the 3DS, which has similar capabilities. Dude, check out those cape physics. <laughs> that looks wonderful. The issue with Terra's parts in the final battle is that the cutscenes make him out to be so weak. He's constantly getting his ass beat no matter what he does, and then we get to gameplay, and... Well, I guess this is where we transition into gameplay a bit, at least what makes Terra unique among the trio. We're going to go into gameplay a lot more heavily when going through Aqua's story, but for now, know that despite what the game says and despite the stats, you can play all three characters the exact same, and the only thing that would change is the time it takes to kill things. By far the best strategy for mom encounters is a combination of Magnet and Thunder commands. Terra's magic stat sucks, so this takes longer, but with enough magic haste abilities, you can repeat this strategy endlessly. And let's not pretend that Terra is any slower when casting magic either, lest you think that they would compromise an aspect of their precious command system for the sake of more distinct characters. Actually, attacking with Terra is just awful. He has a very slow swing, and the end lag on all of his moves is outrageous, even for this game. Let's look at Deep Space, or Lilo and Stitch World. There's an unverse that can teleport, and side note, any enemy that can go invulnerable like these things or the floods have way more invincibility frames than you would actually think. And their hitboxes reappear long before you can actually log onto them. Okay, whatever, weird tangent. Moving on, let's look at what happens when I try and fail to hit it. It teleports away, I try to hit it as it reforms, I whiff because of the bonkers iframes that the enemy has, and Terra is so slow that he can't attack again before the enemy teleports away again. Now I get what they were going for with Terra, where it's hard to hit enemies, especially faster ones, but when you do, it's going to hurt. The issue is in the execution. Terra needed at least 50% more strength to make that concept work, even double might not be enough, because as is, he does only slightly above average damage at appropriate level. Not to mention doing a regular physical combo isn't even your best source of damage for any character. So, we have this guy whose entire gimmick is that his physical combos are supposed to do a lot of damage, but they don't, and you aren't going to be using them that much anyway because they're not even close to the most efficient way to fight. Great. Instead, you'll be using commands. Again, I'll go over them in greater detail when we get into the bulk of the gameplay analysis in Aqua's story, but for now, I want to stress that every character shares almost the same pool of commands as everyone else. There's about 10% difference, I would say. Every character gets Blitz, every character gets Strike Raid, every character gets every level of every basic spell, etc. Most importantly, every character gets Fire and Thunder Surge. These are by far your best and safest options for dealing damage for the majority of the game. They're fast, I believe they're invincible, and they do a grip of damage. In the post-game, mob fights are better handled by Mega Flare, which every character gets by the way, and you need maybe half an hour to grind for it, but until then, and for certain bosses, the Surges and some Cure Commands are all that you'll need. Terra's unique commands, I hear you asking? Get out of here. Dark Haze is a generic dash attack that does average damage. Our Solemn looks cool, but you're completely vulnerable during the entire thing without flinching. So second chance and once more can't activate, meaning you're more vulnerable using it than when you're not. Dark Fireaga? It's a magic attack that's not magnet or thunder, so why bother with Terra since his magic stat sucks? The only reason it exists is one, for Dark Riku fan service, and two, to provide one of like five commands that can activate the Dark Impulse command style through using Dark based attacks, which is kind of Terra's whole thing. Okay, well, what about Terra's unique command styles? Well, command styles in general are the worst thing about Birth by Sleep's combat, but sure, you get his best one after the first fight. Critical Impact does good damage, actually gives Terra's attacks some range, and has a good finisher that can hit multiple enemies if timed and spaced correctly. Great, 
it can only go up from here, right? Well, the next one he gets is Rock Breaker, a faster version of Critical Impact with a worse finisher and that isn't as easily accessible as the former. Dark Impulse? Slow, awkward combos and a terrible finisher that does basically no damage, but hey, it's guaranteed to hit, right? The rest are shared command styles that Terra uses worse than everyone else because he's so much slower than them. What about unique shot locks? Well, shot locks are the second worst part of the combat system, but okay. Sonic Shadow a worse version of every other dash-based shot lock. Dark Volley, a series of dark bullets that don't do much damage. Ultima Cannon, optional, most likely in the post-game, and just a worse version of Mega Flare, which you'll likely have at this point. Great. Finishers? I mean, they're better than Ventus's unique finishers, I guess, but they still don't function properly. The first hit knocks the enemy away, and unless you get lucky or wedge them in a corner, you'll be lucky to get even half of the potential hits that you're supposed to get from them. Wonderful. Oh, and his final one, Demolition, is bonkers long and you can't cancel it if you only need the first one or two shots. Nice. The thing about Terra that a lot of people know and have already commented on is that it feels like the developers never tested anything with him, from enemy design to finishers to the bosses. This is obvious to anyone with a brain, but I would go so far as to say both he and Ventus have that treatment. The only reason Ventus gets away with it is because he has a fully invincible dodge, which Terra doesn't have. In terms of movement options, Terra is the horizontal to Aqua's vertical. While she gets double flight, Terra gets slide and sonic impact, which is the worst movement option in the game by far. Slide is by far the fastest movement option out of any of the characters, save for Ventus' super glide. Its use is obvious and makes moving around as Terra, well, tolerable. What it doesn't do is function as a proper dodge. For a dodge to work in games, it has to do one of two things. It either has to provide some amount of invincibility frames consistent with what the game expects you to have in its design, or it has to serve as an effective repositioning tool in combat. Terra's slide does neither of these things. It was designed the same way as 2FM's dodge roll, where it provides iframes, but they don't last long enough to continue into the next dodge, leaving the player exposed in between them. For Kingdom Hearts 2, this was fine, as that game had much more responsive defensive options aside from that, and its challenges were designed with this in mind, especially ones added along with dodge roll in 2FM. BBS is designed with the fully invincible dodge as a baseline like Aqua and Ventus have, it's a common urban myth that even the developers were unable to beat the mysterious figure superboss with Terra, and it shows regardless of how truthful that claim is. The only option for that fight as Terra is for him to eat damage and then heal it off while praying for once more and second chance to not bug out on him. It's embarrassing. As well, because of how far it travels, it doesn't serve as a good repositioner either, which isn't helped by Terra's attacks having exactly zero range with no gap closure to speak of. To me, the backlash against Terra's dodge is the clearest example of why they split up aerial movement into a combat and non-combat version in Kingdom Hearts 3. I mean, they didn't do it well, but they did it. Finally, we have Terra's bosses. About half of them are shared in some way with another character, but I will admit that Terra's unique bosses are the finest in the game. Especially early on, we have a focus on multiple different targets. His first boss has the arm and the wheel to destroy, which weakens the boss, and his second in Cinderella World has multiple instruments around it, though this is a fake out, as it's most effective to just target down the boss, cleverly using what the game taught you against the player, which I very much appreciated. He shares Aqua's boss in Dwarf Woodlands, shares Trinity armor, and then... Ugh. We have Brague. Brag is the second worst boss in the game, and Terra gets the worst of him. Unlike Aqua, who we will get to, Terra can't cheese the fight. Instead, here's what you have to do. Stand still, and block. And now we're gonna jump into a completely unrelated tangent. Do you guys remember Kingdom Hearts 2 when we fought Zigbar and it was like the most crazy and wild fight ever with a constantly changing arena, super fast bullets, a crazy DM, multiple different options for how to defeat him from blocking and retaliating to reflecting to using Master Form to Duck Flare or maybe Final Form if you had it by then? Yeah? Well then what the fuck is this garbage? When people tell me that this game has just as good of a combat system as Kingdom Hearts 2, I want to slap them for talking bold, first of all, but more so I point to these two fights against essentially the same opponent and meticulously point out the differences. No changing backdrop, no multiple options for retaliation, no different defensive options, and an overall glitchy as hell experience. Oh yeah, this fight glitches, though in the loosest sense. 
I think what may be a better term for it is that it was extremely untested after bug fixing occurred, and no one stopped to think, hmm, maybe this isn't a good idea. Whether or not you die as Terra is completely out of your control. Even if you block perfectly, retaliate only when absolutely safe, and maintain full health the entire time, he could do the run in a circle attack, your guard can fail, and you can die. Wonderful. Just. Fucking. Wonderful. I grinded for once more for this fight. Fuck you. In any case, you get Zack and Olympus, the Lightning Critter in Deep Space, Peter Pan and a remake of the Unversed Horde in Neverland, neat. Oh, after that we have the exclusive Master Ericus fight, which is widely regarded as one of the worst fights in the game. Mm -hmm. And then we have a Xehanort and Vanitas tag match, Xehanort by himself, and then Terra Xehanort as the final boss, and... I mean... It doesn't matter what I say. It really doesn't. If one gameplay mechanic defined my Terra playthrough, it would be what I named the second worst aspect of the combat system. Shot locks. They are broken. I know Magnet or Reflect could be considered broken, or Gravity, or like any slight from Recom, but really, there's almost no comparison. At least Magnet and Reflect had either timing or a high MP cost as barriers. At least the slights had the prerequisite of understanding the deck building system so that you can exploit it. Shot locks? Equip it, hold a button, do a QTE. Even Balloon in Dream Drop Distance, a spell notorious for completely undermining the game, had a small amount of risk involved in first obtaining it. I don't think you get it from a chest until Prankster's Paradise or something, right? Which is like the fourth world in the game. You can get by far the best shot lock in the game after the very first encounter before you ever go to a Disney World. When you leave the Land of Departure, you unlock the command board for that world, and don't worry, we will get to the command board. But anyway, you play it, you can get Ragnarok, you can equip it, and you win the game. Congratulations. There are exactly two fights in the entirety of Terra's story that are A, hard enough that it even matters, and B, aren't entirely cheesable by Ragnarok. The first is Brag, because of his teleporting, and the second is the final boss, Terra Xehanort. Why? Because unlike regular Terra, he has a fully invincible dodge of fucking course! Every other boss, even those lauded by fans as some of the hardest in the game, like Ericus, are completely destroyed by Ragnarok. My Ericus fight didn't even last a full minute. I killed him in two shot locks, which you can get for 200 money for two ethers at the shop. So don't even try and tell me I prepared ahead of time to cheese the fight. Ragnarok, and how powerful shot locks are in general, but mostly Ragnarok, is the reason why I chose to keep my shot lock usage to a minimum with both other characters, and I kept myself from getting Ragnarok with either of them. If I didn't, I would have nothing to discuss about the rest of the combat system, because I would have never used any of it. And really, it's not like this is anything new for the Kingdom Hearts series. Again, Ars Arcanum and Genie Jafar in Recom, Magnet Reflect, and even Limit Form in Kingdom Hearts 2 FM, the latter being especially similar to Shot Locks in that, despite the game claiming that they're best used for crowd control, if anything, Shot Locks are boss slayers, just like Limit Form was. It's the only move you have that resembles a limit from the other games. It grants invincibility while having a hitbox and doing a lot of damage. The difference is, Limit Form actually requires some amount of skill. I'm not going to pretend that it takes a lot of skill, but it does take some and a fair amount of knowledge about the game. To maximize its boss killing potential, you need to have at least a rudimentary understanding of the revenge value system. With shot locks, you need to find a very small opening, keep a cursor on the boss, which isn't hard because most of them are gigantic, and then do some kind of timing challenge or QTE to extend the shot lock. Riveting. There's absolutely no risk involved once you start the shot lock, and it takes only the bare minimum of good execution to completely decimate bosses. If I had to sum up Terra's story in a word, I would call it unfinished. He's missing so many things that you would expect from a Kingdom Hearts game. In terms of gameplay, a gap closer is right up there. His dodge is terrible, most of his command styles are crap, and his bosses are either forgettable or, you know, break. On the story side of things, we have a solid idea of a man slowly being consumed by the darkness within him. However, the terrible execution is what holds it back. Jason Doring seems to try at times, but more often fails to sell the role. The script does him no favors, and Terra himself generally just comes off as an idiot. Out of all of his cutscenes, I would say that I liked Terra's character in… two of them. The one with Zack, and the one with Riku. 
Out of a 10 hour campaign, that's pathetic. Oh yeah, and this campaign barely lasted 10 hours, if not less because I had to keep pausing to bask in just how bad, boring, and bland the entire experience was. And funnily enough, all three of those adjectives can fit just as snugly against Ventus's tight ass. While many people rightly accuse Terra of being a boring or frustrating character to play because of his slowness, lack of variety, and bad magic, I would argue Ventus has it even worse. Though it's damning with faint praise, Terra's physical attacks are by far the most satisfying to use of the trio because at least his attacks have some weight. They were, of course, all show and no power, but they at least looked like they had some effort put in. With Ventus, in both looks and feel, it's all weak sauce. There's something to be said about the Jack of All Trades Master of None archetype. Sora himself is one when looking at his companions in Donald and Goofy. Every character is this in Bravely Default to allow for maximum customization of the party's class and build, though that game also doesn't work because of randomness in a numbers-based system, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Lightning is also this in Final Fantasy XIII, and like every main character in a fighting game is designed to be this, for new players to be able to jump in and play as them without learning about too many technicalities. There's also something to be said about the speedy archetype. Edge in Final Fantasy IV, Titus in Final Fantasy X, the Dual Blades, and to a lesser extent the Sword and Shield in Monster Hunter, and of course prankster users in Pokemon are usually excellent annoyers. The problem with Ven is that he doesn't serve any of the purposes that these other character types serve. Not least because, as I said when talking about Terra, you don't ever have to change how you play the game. Every character plays the exact same, save for their movement and physical combos. The Jack of All Trades archetype is best used for a main character, the person who you'll be controlling either first or most often. They're supposed to be the baseline that you compare every other playable character to. Ventus is the second character that you're intended to play as, as denoted by his placement in the character selection screen. Of course, you can play as him first, I know I did when I played this game for the first time, but the developers clearly wanted you to play his story second, at least in the final build of the game. His story is also, if anything, shorter than the other two's for two reasons. First, his initial worlds are smaller and less story heavy. He has a tiny area of both Dwarf Woodlands and Castle of Dreams to explore compared to Terra and Aqua, and his visit to Enchanted Dominion, while seeing him explore every room in the world save for, oddly, the prison cell in Maleficent's castle, has basically no story to speak of. Secondly, he has less bosses than any of them, with no extra boss at the end of Radiant Garden, no boss at the end of Olympus, and only two final bosses compared to Terra's three, and Aqua's two, plus the final and secret secret episodes in their entirety. As for his title as the speediest trio, well that's just a straight up lie. The backhanded grip, while cool, is very ineffective for actually fast attacks. If anything, he should have been the powerhouse, because to get even remotely close to the same swing arc as with a front-handed grip, you have to put your whole body into the attack, resulting in more power on average at the cost of range. Even in gameplay, where real life physics don't really matter, Aqua has a faster ground combo, and Terra, yes, Terra, has has a faster air combo, though he has no range. As for commands? I mean, he casts magic and does physical attacks at the same speed as the others. Yay. And even apart from that, he takes longer to kill things anyway, as his stats are pitiful. He has better magic than Terra, sure, but on critical mode, that hardly matters. And Terra gets a much better initial command style, too. Just look at my Neverland damage. I'm at appropriate level with the most recent Keyblade I received. I could have one more point of strength if I equipped the Keyblade from Olympus. But here I am, doing chip damage. Gold Star. I mentioned his command styles, of which he has three to his name, Fever Pitch, Cyclone, and Wingblade. The former is basically Valor Form from KH2 in the significantly worse combat system of BBS. You'll be lucky if you actually hit the enemies twice with the basic hit, and the finisher looks incredibly weak compared to both Critical Impact and Spellweaver for Aqua. Cyclone is alright, I guess. It's certainly powerful, but it feels like the most boring of them all, which is a shame. It's one of two command styles that have wind as their elements. Both of them are tier 2 command styles, and both of them are situational at best. That they didn't give Arrow a dedicated tier 1 command style, especially considering Ventus's primary element is wind, is pretty terrible planning in my opinion, but I suppose I could also say that for both Terra and Aqua, as Terra gets Rockbreaker and Dark Impulse, both tier 2 styles, and Aqua gets... 
Finally, Wingblade is by far the best command style in the game, and is incredibly easy to activate since you can do so with magnets, which you'll likely be using if you're like me. It's basically final form, but without any of the depth and all of the power. Its attacks are incredibly strong, but there's no nuance to how you go about things, which can unfortunately be said for every command style, as all they change are your base physical combos, rather than changing everything like drive forms or even some form changes in Kingdom Hearts 3. As a bit of a consolation, I guess, Wingblade is the only time that Ventus feels like the fastest character in the game, so, you know, maybe 3% of the time, so, you know, take what you can get here. Well, okay, maybe his finishers are faster. Yeah, faster at testing my goddamn patience, maybe. Ventus has by far the worst finishers of the trio. Terra's already weren't great, and Ventus's only gets worse from there. His air flare line starts with a flurry of blows, followed by an increasing amount of jumps with gusts of wind. The initial flurry cannot hit floating enemies, at least not consistently. Very rarely will I get a few hits in, but most of the time it's one or none. I feel like I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Remake here. His final finisher, Stratosphere, has QTEs that gave you about 5 milliseconds to react to them. Great. Cool. Explosion is better. Moving on. Well, okay, how about shot locks? Well, unlike Terra and Aqua, Ventus doesn't even start with a unique shot lock, and unlike the other two, he only gets two unique ones as opposed to the other's three. Well, in normal gameplay at least. During the gimmick phase of the final fight, he has a third which doesn't do damage and sucks because that whole fight sucks, so we're moving on. Pulse Bomb is... no better than any other shot lock of its variety. Multi Vortex... Takes too long to lock on to be useful. Yes, it is actually slower than any other shot lock. As opposed to those, which only take about two seconds to get the maximum lock on, Multi Vortex takes several. And for what? A bunch of spinning attacks and then a whirlwind. <sighs> On a brief tangent, this is actually pretty interesting. Each character has a unique shot lock for two of the three different varieties. The Ragnarok type, the Dash type, and the Bullet type. Terra has Dark Volley and Sonic Shadow, which despite everything pointing to the contrary is classified as dealing neutral damage instead of dark damage for some stupid reason. Aqua has Prism Rain and Bubble Blaster, and Ventus has... just Pulse Bomb. These differences could have paved the way to further differentiate these characters, pushing them into a certain playstyle based on what kind of shot lock they use. But unfortunately, all shot locks have the same function, have almost no unique properties save for lock on count and maybe elemental damage, and it's left half baked anyway since Ventus drew the short straw. In fact, a lot of the game feels half baked and or unfinished, but we'll go into more of that later. Back on topic, the only way that Ventus is actually faster than Terra and Aqua is that he gets the overall best movement abilities. His dodge roll is everything Terra's slide isn't, with perfect iframes and acting as a decent repositioner. He of course gets high jump, he gets air slide, and he gets glide and super glide, being the only one of the trio to do so. Now I'm not going to sit here and complain that super gliding isn't fun, or else I'd have to say the same thing about Kingdom Hearts 1, where it functions almost identically. Instead, I'll complain about how you obtain super glide. As with Terra, you don't get every movement ability through the story, only those that are necessary for the game's completion. Although this isn't really true since you never actually need glide to get around as Ventus, but whatever, neither here nor there. This particular aspect is 100% fine as far as I'm concerned, but what I don't like is how you get all of the extra stuff. Instead of having to complete some optional challenge for the single best movement ability in the game, such as how you had to complete certain cups to get certain magic spells in Kingdom Hearts 1, all Ventus has to do is get across this gap in Disney Town. The intended way is, of course, glide, but something that you'll quickly learn if you experiment at all is that Birth by Sleep is incredibly broken when it comes to sequence breaking to get extra loot. Just off the top of my head, you can use a surge or sliding dash to get to this Fission Firaga command with both Terra and Aqua. You can clip with Aqua to get this sticker. I know speedrunners use the Cinderella D-Link to skip part of the garden room in Radiant Garden, and of course we have this. 200 money. That is all you need to get the two sliding dashes necessary to cross this gap. You get the best movement ability in the game for 200 money. This game's movement system in general borrows heavily from the Kingdom Hearts 1 style, right down to Ventus having the exact same moves, save for adding Air Slide, which I think was a good addition. For as fun as it was to have max movement abilities in KH2, the method of obtaining them was heavily flawed, which was fixed in this game and later entries as well. My few complaints lay in the minutia, though at least one aspect affects the entire experience, which I'll get to more in the gameplay analysis. 
For a minor example, in every other appearance, Dodro functions like an actual roll, with different momentum for different parts of the maneuver. In this game, there isn't a build up and slow down at the beginning and end, it's just a flat jump in speed for a second before screeching back to your normal speed. And the major example is, of course, the floatiness, which affects everything about the game's feel, but again, more on that later. What I can definitively complain about though, with the movement system and just how the game generally feels, is the camera. We'll get into how it clips and jerks around everywhere momentarily, but for now, let's just look at how close it is to the player character. Why? Again, this is more similar to KH1, but here's the rub. That wasn't a good part of that game. The camera was by far the weakest aspect of its presentation and game feel, where in the original game you had to use L2 and R2 to rotate it, the right analog stick just controlled the menu, and Birth by Sleep wanted to pay homage to that clunky piece of shit? At the risk of slipping into gameplay analysis here, the result of having such a close camera is that you can't effectively keep your eyes on the action, and you have far from a big picture perspective on encounters. One of the most frustrating things in Kingdom Hearts 1 was being in the middle of a fight and some off-screen enemy three miles away snipes you with a projectile and either kills you or lets the enemy you are focusing on run away or retaliate and kill you. Well, we have the same thing here, only combined with a worse version of the rapid hits and enemy combo system of Kingdom Hearts 2 where enemies can hit and now combo you without you even being aware because the camera is so damn close to you you can't possibly keep track of it all. Another quick side note, on the PC version of BBS, there's a really cool mod which artificially zooms things out. And the first thing I notice is that you can really feel a difference in intensity. Like it makes it abundantly clear how empty and lifeless a lot of the environments are when you're not in the thick of the battle. But more importantly, it actually lets you see the battle a lot easier, potentially allowing for smarter play. Thing is, this isn't even a new mod. The developers implemented it, in Dream Drop Distance. Yes, when looking at the original 3DS version of DDD, the camera acts very similarly to Birth by Sleep, but when you jump over to the HD remaster for PS4, huh, would you look at that? Now I don't know why they didn't do this for Birth by Sleep, at least from the jump from PS3 to PS4, since they had to change the 60fps anyway, but I think we can all agree that it's an improvement when it comes to game feel. But maybe they didn't want to change it because of what I mentioned earlier. With the camera so close, it's really hard to notice just how lifeless a lot of the game is since you're right in the thick of things. Maybe they wanted to hide that fact from us. Because exploring in BBS is incredibly dull, partially because of that lifelessness. I'll go on record and say that every single Kingdom Hearts game beats it out when it comes to level design. Yes, even Chain of Memories in Kingdom Hearts 2. There are interesting ideas for locales in Birth by Sleep, but the execution is about as bland as can be. There's no interesting terrain, about 60% of environments are flat plains with at most minor slopes here and there, and another 35% are flat plains split between a few layers, with maybe a staircase or slope separating them. Even Kingdom Hearts 2 has the sloped hallway with two paths in Olympus, or the room in Agrabah with the pillars and chests, and even the bazaar in the same world. Halloween Town's Cane to Cane Lane has the centerpiece of the spinning thing where you can use it and it has a magnet effect. Did that game not have as much of this as it should have? Absolutely, but it at least had something. A lot of people claim that this game sort of returns to form with the interconnected levels of Kingdom Hearts 1, but I would heavily disagree. The interconnectedness in this game is likely due to hardware limitations first off, and second off, it's not even anything substantial. Kingdom Hearts 2 did the exact thing this game does. Okay, rewind to 2006. Remember in Olympus on the second path you go through? You go through the initial room, and then you enter a room that's a bit maze-like, right? And then you can enter another room, and then it takes you back to the first one. Yeah, there were a few chests there on a higher ledge, and in Final Mix version, there was a puzzle piece. It's kinda neato. Well, that's Birth by Sleep's one use for connecting areas of levels. The Super Glide chest in Disney Town is handled like this, where you come out in a high area that you couldn't access from below, the standard way to get to the area, and there's also that same thing literally the same thing actually in Neverland. I'm not going to sit here and say that any game other than Kingdom Hearts 1 had really anything better, but at least that game did have 
far better than this. It had platforming arenas and interesting puzzles and optional secrets, like hitting the clock in the hotel room in Traverse Town, and making an item in Deep Jungle, and freezing platforms in Hollow Bastion. The only thing that comes close to that is in Dwarf Woodlands, where you have to use a fire-based command on these pots to make bubbles that can lift you up, which is one time in one world and Ventus doesn't even do it. As well, in Disney Town, in a completely optional, like, 80% of the world that you never have to go to, you have to use thunder-based attacks on this generator. But that's not even a puzzle, because the chests in the room all have thunder in them, which definitely isn't obvious at all, especially with the design of the generator thing. Now... That's not to say that there's nothing to like about the level design in Birth by Sleep. I may not like it, but it's not completely devoid of merit. For one, a nice touch was placed in both Dwarf Woodlands and Enchanted Dominion. In the former, in the area where the dwarf's hut is, where Snow White ate the poisoned apple and fell into a coma, you get a poison command. Likewise, in the room adjacent to where Aurora is in her endless sleep, you get the sleep command as Ventus. This kind of theming is present in a few more areas as well, like Ventus getting treasure raid in the pirate-rich Neverland, but I don't think there was nearly enough of it. I know I sound like a broken record here, but for now, I think an interesting half-finished idea that's already present in the game could have greatly helped in its balancing. Level theming around spells. Let's do some basic math here. There are seven spells in the game that have the usual three tiers. Fire, Blizzard, Thunder, Cure, Arrow, Magnet, and Zero Gravity. Conveniently as well, there are seven major worlds that you visit throughout the game. Well, what if each spell was tied specifically to a world? I mean, they already basically do this with the first three with the princesses, though, again, it's half-hearted. Dwarf Woodlands is based around fire, with the pots that you need to light to make bubbles. Exploding jars, you get Fission Freiraga and the Flame Salvo Shotlock here. Ventus learns Firestorm and fights a tree that spits bombs, and the Magic Mirror Boss shoots fireballs at you as well. The other two worlds aren't nearly as strong in their association, but the softer blue hues of a lot of Cinderella World, or Castle of Dreams, supports a Blizzard association, and likewise both Enchanted Dominion's green slash yellow color palette and Maleficent's use of lightning in her Ventus fight supports its association with the thunder element. And you could tie every world into this really, and it would not be hard in the slightest. Radiant Garden, the world filled with life and growth, supports Cure. Olympus doesn't have a super strong association with anything, but Deep Space can be tied to zero gravity, and Neverland can be tied with the Arrow spell, leaving Olympus with Magnet. And you could also switch those last two, Arrow for the association with Zeus as the god of the sky, and Magnetic Poles making compasses work for the pirates or something. I think if they matched each world to an element more strongly, it would provide actual choice to the player in how they want to go through those worlds. Like the characters gain access to the different elements mental commands in each associated world. As is, with the Keyblades and General Rewards so irrelevant now, there's no reason not to just go with the standard battle level order, which has its own issues. For example, in the official timeline, Terra goes to Enchanted Dominion, then Dwarf Woodlands, and then Castle of Dreams. But the battle level order, as in the order that the developers intended for you to go through these first set of worlds, is Enchanted Dominion, Castle of Dreams, and then Dwarf Woodlands. Keeping with the idea of the game just being completely unfinished, I think at some point that Ventus's and Aqua's visits to Dwarf Woodlands and Cinderella World were swapped. So Ventus would have gone to Castle of Dreams first, while Aqua would have gone to Dwarf Woodlands first. Evidence? Well, when Ventus goes into Cinderella World, his second world, he's annoyed and confused as to how he got so small. It's kind of half implied that this is due to his inexperience when traveling between worlds, or at the very least, it could have been justified like that. Meanwhile, there was no issue with his visit to Dwarf Woodlands, his first world. It's just a really short visit. Meanwhile, back at the beginning, Terra leaves the Land of Departure, then Ventus leaves right after him, and Aqua is on his ass shortly after that. Maybe two minutes passed from Terra leaving until Aqua left. And yet, timeline-wise, Aqua's first world, Cinderella World, starts at the exact moment that Terra's visit there, his canonical third world visited, ends. Why has so much time passed? They were displaced by, like I said, about two minutes of time, and yet Terra has done three complete world visits by the time Aqua lands in her first. If she'd gone to Dwarf Woodlands first, and then Castle of Dreams, it would make a lot more sense. But alas. Then, it would be that Aqua does what Ventus does, catch the dwarves, and then guide Snow White to the cabin in the woods, while Ventus would have found her asleep and gone to confront the evil queen like Aqua does now. It would have fit a lot more nicely that way. Finally circling things back around to the level design in general, I would call it surprisingly small. 
Unlike in the other games, it only takes a few seconds to travel between rooms in BBS, except for Aqua who has the slowest movement speed. With her, it feels much more akin to the size of Kingdom Hearts 2, but even then the worlds are much smaller. This isn't helped by that each character only visits a small portion of most of the worlds. Even after you complete the world, there are some areas that you just can't go to for some reason that I can't fathom. All the game gives an explanation is the character thinking to themselves, there's nothing down that way. Which, how do they know? The strangest one is with Ventus in Enchanted Dominion. He can go to every single room in the entire world, except the prison cell. Why? It would provide a safe point for inside Maleficent's castle, which it lacks now, and it's literally the only one that you can't enter as Ventus, when literally every single other room is fully explorable. Now it makes sense in Neverland that Ventus and Terra can't access Aqua's path because there are no floating orbs to get to the higher platforms, but that prison cell example is just awful walling for no reason. I'm almost tempted to call it like an oversight in development because it's so weird. As for the rooms themselves and their designs, they're mostly on the level of KH2 or even a little worse. Very few rooms have anything interesting to them, and those that do often only serve to frustrate the player because the combat system was designed around their flat planes that make up the majority of play space. Rooms like the main room in Neverland with the little pond to swim in or the tall silo room in Deep Space come to mind easily. The former has the flaw of if an enemy falls into the water, even a floating enemy by the way, it will immediately despawn and then respawn with full health again. Like, wow, that just speaks for itself. As for the silo room, it's just awkward. Only Aqua is able to move freely around it without messing with Deep Space's gravity shifting gimmick, and that's only after you backtrack to it once you get double flight from Neverland. So, until then, and with Ventus and Terra, with the gravity gimmick, you jump, you let go of the jump button, their upward momentum just stops incredibly awkwardly, and then you gently float down to the platform you were aiming for. It's just awful in terms of both game feel and exploration pacing. It actively disincentivizes the player from exploring because it feels so awful. And not only does it not feel good to move around in there, but the rewards you get aren't even worth it. And come to think of it, that criticism could apply to every single collectible in this entire game. Scattered around the levels are stickers, which are this game's version of the puzzle pieces from Kingdom Hearts 2. The thing about the puzzle pieces was that they served a purpose. The original game didn't have platforming, so the puzzle pieces, though unsuccessfully, aimed to add platforming back in. The stickers don't. Most are just there in plain sight where you literally just jump off the ground and grab it. Some are like that, but are locked behind high jump or some other movement ability. Others, no, that's actually all of them. Instead of the over 100 from Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, there are a piddly 20 per character here, which can be placed on a picture and scored based on their location, as opposed to solving a puzzle and getting an awesome wallpaper as in Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. For some people, that's great. It certainly means that there's less backtracking to do to collect everything. But for me, it makes me wonder why the hell they're even here. And believe it or not, this was worse in the original release of the game. Birth by Sleep is the first spin-off title in the series to receive a Final Mix re-release like the numbered games did. As a part of this, they changed how stickers work to have a grand total of 140 possible scorable points to earn per character, with a new command style, Rhythm Mixer, as your ultimate reward for all three characters. Great. Another fucking command style. In any case, back to how they affect the exploration, or rather, how they don't. For a moment, I want to jump over to another game with a similarly useless collectible. In Okami, you play as the goddess Amaterasu, traveling around Nippon and cleansing the land of various evils. As part of this, you have to explore Nippon, and scattered throughout the world in both the large areas and the dungeons are the stray beads. There are 100 of these to collect, and until you have them all, they are 100% useless, as with the stickers in BBS, where the only worthwhile reward you get is Rhythm Mixer. However, in Okami, the act of finding and then obtaining the stray beads is often the reward in and of itself. It's a game largely based around exploring every nook and cranny of this ancient world to find whatever you can. You get rewarded with extra abilities, power-ups, extra minigames, and if you collect all of the stray beads, you get to completely break the final boss. Some of the collectibles are pretty obtuse, which isn't great, but there was much more thought put into how the player was likely to interact with the gameplay loop and mechanics. The game gives you all of these different abilities in the brush techniques and so rewards you for using them. 
In Birth by Sleep, the stickers serve no such function. Sometimes they're right there, sometimes they're shown to you but gated behind later movement abilities. This isn't something like noticing a conspicuous pile of leaves in Okami, where you wonder, hmm, I wonder why that's there, only to get the wind power and have the chance to put two and two together and then be rewarded for it. To quote Joseph Anderson, these are notice something collectibles, and the fun stops there. The same can be said of treasure chests. Gone are the days of Kingdom Hearts 1 where they're hidden behind puzzles or require some other method of obtaining goodies like the Trinity Marks. We're sticking with the Kingdom Hearts 2 method where they're just out in the open. And I'm actually more sympathetic with that game, however, as the chests were often guarded by enemies, forcing you to at least engage with the game through its combat. In Birth by Sleep, the combat is terrible, and chests are split half and half between that style and just being tucked on the edges of different rooms with little thought put into them. The most interesting chest to get in the game is one that every character shares. In Disney Town, on your way to get to the top of the raceway room where Ventus can get Super Glide, there's a room with a pinball machine. On it, there are pink and green zits that bounce your character around. If you hit all of the green zits without leaving the room, the center window opens, allowing you to get the break time command. This is a completely useless command, the game even says so, but the method to obtain it is... Well, it's better than just being on the edge of a room or around a corner. But I mean, it's not like you're getting anything worthwhile anyway. Items are plentiful from drops and so useless outside of very specific circumstances anyway. Commands are usually repeats that you could easily just buy or are better attained through the command melding system to get abilities. Crystals are useful early on, but by the end I had an excess of almost every single one. The only useful things you get from chests are the extra action commands like reversal, high jump, and counter blast. But even then, some of those are useless. Terra doesn't benefit from high jump unless you're going for 100% completion. Teleport is downright detrimental for Aqua, as unlike Ventus's reversal, she doesn't get an invincible follow-up. So, you go to block an attack, instead she teleports, the enemy automatically tracks to you, because this game is just fantastic when it comes to auto-tracking, and you get hit because you have no iframes after the teleport, and it all happens so fast that you couldn't react and block after the teleport. So, we have a movement system that has flaws with two out of the three characters, no fun loot to use that movement, and no fun levels to explore on top of that. When the best I can say about an entire half of the gameplay is, I like the theming which doesn't do enough anyway, then why the hell am I here? And as for the other half of the gameplay? We'll get to it. Before we go into Ventus's story, I want to go over the minigames. As is series tradition, they're all terrible, so while I'm going to shit on them here, know that I could apply this criticism to any minigame in the entire franchise. So I just want to rant for a minute. We have four major ones, along with a single throwaway one in Olympus, which is just a worse version of Barrels from Kingdom Hearts 1, which is saying something, by the way. As for the others, three of them are in Disney Town, Rumble Racing, Ice Cream Beat, and Fruit Ball. And then we also have the command board, but we will get to that. I have almost nothing to say about Rumble Racing. Mario Kart, Jack X Combat Racing, and F-Zero all stomp this piece of shit into the ground. Now is that fair? No. But does it encompass my general thoughts and feelings while playing it? Absolutely. You can accelerate, power break, shield, and attack. There are launch ramps, boost rings, and tornadoes as obstacles. There are four tracks, three of which share assets, and one which is unique. Don't I sound enthralled? And besides the lack of originality in it all, it doesn't even work properly. Rubber banding is a mechanic in most modern racing games, where if you are very far ahead, the AI opponents will speed up, whereas if you're behind, they'll slow down. It's meant to always give the impression of a close race, even if it logically shouldn't have been. In Birth by Sleep, this system is broken. I have no idea why it breaks sometimes, but in one race, I could literally lap my opponents, and in another, I'm constantly having to fight them off my ass. There's no consistency at all. And it's also rigged in your opponent's favor. I could attack them, and while I'm attacking, they could activate their own attack, and I would lose the exchange despite having initiated first. It happened to me. Multiple times. And oh my god, that's not even mentioning the camera either. It does this in regular gameplay as well, but it's especially noticeable at these high speeds, where it jerks around corners constantly. Honestly, watching it back is kind of nauseating, so we're moving on. Ice Cream Beat is by far the best minigame in Birth by Sleep, which is damning with faint praise, admittedly. It's the second of three attempts to make a Kingdom Hearts rhythm game, and it's not bad. Huey, Dewey, and Louie clap a beat, and you have to match it afterwards. 
it's functional, and I would even say I had some fun with it. But if I were going for perfect scores, I would think very differently. The timing for what counts as good and what counts as excellent seems to be out of sync with the music at times, which would be a huge problem if this were a full-fledged game, but to complete this minigame for the journal, you don't have to be nearly perfect. As well as another small gripe, in some master courses, the ducklets will continue clapping into your turn, which I don't think is very fair to make you concentrate on your timing while also still listening for the rest of the pattern. However, the songs are good, it doesn't overstay its welcome, and you at least only have to do this once per character. As for Fruit Ball, fuck Fruit Ball. Who is this made for? Not only do you have to deal with the floaty ass movement of BBS, but you have altered controls. You can no longer use your dodge to reposition quickly. Instead, the square button is replaced by a curveball attack. Basically, it's a combination between dodgeball and soccer, where instead of just hitting your opponents, you have to score in their goals. You can hit a fruit, you can curve hit a fruit, which adds spin to the strike, or you can bump. From a bump, you can either slam the fruits into their goal, or you can hit it at the opponent, which stuns them and breaks apart both the bananas, which pelts that side of the field with hazards, or the grapes, so now each individual grape counts as its own separate fruit that can score a point. There's nothing hard about the first two rounds or the one you play in Aqua Story, but the final round against Pete is bullshit. He warps to catch any of your shots, and it feels like nothing but random chance dictates whether his model stops short and lets you score, or if it goes all the way, as there's no animation difference between those two different outcomes. Fruit Ball is boring. There's little strategy to the game that you can implement, not only due to whether the enemies defend against your shots, but also due to the fruit you receive, how the enemies hit the grapes and bananas, whether or not you get stunned by a fruit hitting you, or whether your bump will dash to the fruit in front of you, or if it will assume you want to bump the fruit that's a thousand feet in the air at the time. I cannot stand that much random chance in a competition of this variety. If this is supposed to be a sport in-universe, you'd think that they would try to level the playing field a bit, right? Apparently not. Fuck Fruit Ball. Finally, we come to the command board. This is far and away the most prolific minigame in Birth by Sleep in terms of the amount of time it takes, though technically speaking, you have to do more rounds of rumble racing to get everything than you have to do the command board, save for getting some unique commands. Think Monopoly with a Birth by Sleep twist. It's a board game. The object of the game is to collect a certain amount of GP and then return to the starting point. To collect GP, you go around to the four colored nodes on the map and then lap to the starting point and repeat. Along the way, there are various tiles you can land on. Blank tiles allow you to place commands on them like you gain property in Monopoly, with a toll required for any other player that lands on that tile. There are also special command tiles that already have a command placed on them that you can then purchase to the same effect as before, it incurs a toll. There are also void tiles, which steal GP away from you, but each of these zones comes with a block that you can ride. After a certain amount of tile movements, the block breaks, and the player that did it receives all of the GP and more that the void tile stole. There are also special tiles, which grant unique effects depending on which board you're on. The Land of Departure lets you warp to a tile of your choosing, Castle of Dreams gains you GP based on a die roll, Hundred Acre Wood spawns bees and honey which gain and lose you GP if you land on them, etc. These special tiles can also spawn Pete in his Justice or Dark personas. The former gives you GP every turn, and the latter steals GP or overbuys a tile for more than it's worth and he will switch hands if you pass by another player. At the start of the game, you're given five cards which are commands from your inventory. Depending on their type, you can expend them to gain certain advantages, like rolling more dice on your turn or protecting your GP for a set number of turns. At the end, win or lose, the commands you placed on the board as quote-unquote property gain CP to level up. And really, that's it. I know it sounds like a lot, but for a dice game, it's incredibly simple. And that's really the biggest problem. It's so simple. Unlike Fruit Ball, I'm not particularly broken up about the randomness present in the command board. It's a dice game. Chance is a core part of all of them. That said, the better dice games incorporate one of two things to keep them engaging. They either give you a good amount of freedom in how you want to play, like D&D, and or there is a healthy amount of strategy in mind games to win. The command board doesn't have either aspect. There is no freedom. There is only one way to win, gain GP. And the only consistent way to do that is to do the lap. 
There are small decisions to be made in the routes, but they're decisions that you make in four seconds by looking at the board, rather than carefully planning out your moves or formulating some grand strategy like you would in other dice games. Every game will generally play out the same no matter what board you play. It's only the time that it takes that changes. Boards take anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes at the minimum requirements, and with having to complete seven boards to get the Ultima weapon, and more boards to collect every unique command for each character, it gets old really fast. The element of chance is the only thing that's remotely exciting, and more often than not, if you're like me who just did this for the completion aspect, it's just frustrating. The AI is so bad that you have to get extremely unlucky to lose against them, which admittedly happened to me once. So when you know you're going to win 90% of the time and then you consistently roll ones or twos, it's infuriating because all it's doing at that point is wasting your time. That said, in the original PSP release, there was a small sliver of hope. Nice. Multiplayer. Yes, the original BBS had local multiplayer where you can do Mirage Arena missions with friends, including the command board and rumble racing. The multiplayer aspect makes an inherently random game like this much more fun solely due to the rapport between players. Dicking each other over, clutch rolls, and more deliberate pathing to accommodate the smarter opponents would have made the command board infinitely better than it stands now. Unfortunately, the remasters on PS3, PS4, Xbone, and PC lack multiplayer. Instead, the Mirage Arena challenges have been rebalanced to accommodate solo play, which is a great change for the battle portion, but awful for everything else. I don't understand why they didn't just adapt the local multiplayer into online multiplayer here, considering that it was another aspect that BBS was marketed on originally. They've just taken away one of its main selling points. But I mentioned some things back there that may be a bit disconcerting to completionists. More command boards to get other commands? Each character? To lay it on the table, I chose not to 100% the game for this video. That being said, I did see all of the unique content that this game had to offer. The thing is, as a handheld game originally, BBS was made to keep you playing for a long time, as with most handheld titles. To that end, each character has a separate journal, and you have to complete all three of them to get 100%. So, you have to collect every command with every character, including those shared between them. You have to do every minigame and arena challenge with each character individually. And you can't even do that until you complete all of their stories, as some challenges are unavailable until other stories are complete. You have to beat all four super bosses with every character individually. You have to collect every chest and sticker with every character individually. My total playtime, including the bloat of leaving the game running sometimes, was just shy of 50 hours, the longest I've played one of these games for a video. That said, if I did literally everything, the playtime would probably be upwards of 75 hours, depending on how long it takes to grind everything out and best all of the super bosses, with Terra especially. To go over what I did, I completed every story, obviously, and I got every major unique unlockable with every character. So I got all of their finishers, I collected every chest and sticker, and I got all of their unique shot locks. Then, as Aqua, I went all of the way and did everything, save for getting every command, since that's just mindless grinding for no reward and no analytical value. Speaking of those stories though, let's finally move on to Ventus's. This is criticism common to all three stories, but Ventus' story is completely forgettable. As I said at the beginning of the video, he's everything I don't like about Sora. Post-KH2, Sora is depicted as this overly trusting dweeb with absolutely no edge to his personality. This is a betrayal of a character, which we'll get to in DDD and Kingdom Hearts 3, but for now, these are the traits that Ventus takes from him, but without any of the depth that Sora at least has shades of in his later incarnations. I do understand what they were going for, that Ventus is this beacon of light that is absolutely incorruptible by his very nature. He is the remaining half of light from when Xehanort separated him and Vanitas, the embodiment of his darkness. However, in execution, he's just this happy-go-lucky little kid who I don't care about and who has nothing else to his character other than am friends with Terra and Aqua, which amounts to nothing. The first half of his story is his search for Terra, and like Terra's story, which was, is Xehanort here? No? Well, I'll stay and help anyway. Ventus's plays out like, is Terra here? No? Well, I'll stay and help anyway. In the second half, when both of his friends have told him to piss off, he's out to... look for new friends. Riveting. 
As with the rest of the game, no character shares any chemistry with any other character, so this doesn't really pan out and we're left with a nothing story. Like Terra, Ventus has about two scenes where he's passable. First, his visit to Castle of Dreams, while unremarkable, feels like a Kingdom Hearts world and works as a good baseline for Ventus in these worlds, far more than his showing in Dwarf Woodlands, by the way. Second, at the end of his Radiant Garden visit, he runs into Lee and Isa, who would later become Axel and Syx. This is when Ventus is in a funk after Terra and Aqua have abandoned him, and the scene between the three of them breathes enough life into Ventus, both in-universe and for me, that I felt motivated to continue his story. I don't think either of these two instances compared to Terra's visit to Destiny Islands, but they were… fine. Better than the average for this game, which may again be damning with faint praise. In terms of main plot stuff, Ventus's main antagonist is Vanitas, as Terra's was Xehanort. Vanitas is far and away the worst character in the entire game. Now he's not the most boring, that title belongs to Aqua, but he is the worst constructed character. Let me ask you this, what does Vanitas do in Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep? Aside from the final battle, the answer is that he trolls the other characters. He saunters up to them at random, talks mad shit, gets his ass peed, and then runs away. The only time he ever remotely poses a threat is Ventus' first encounter with him, but then he gets his ass kicked by Mickey Mouse. And while his encounters can sort of be justified in the moment, in full context of the story, Vanitas is just a moron. For Xehanort's plan to work, he has to wait for Ventus to become strong enough to match him in order for their clash to forge the Kai Blade. That is his game plan. Wait and do nothing to rock the boat. And yet, in his first encounter with Ventus, he says, well, I don't think I need you, and tries to kill him before he's ready for no reason at all. There is never an explanation for this. There's never a scene where Xehanort reprimands or punishes Vanitas for him blatantly going against his machinations. He just randomly shows up in Radiant Garden and Neverland to fight Aqua with no explanation for why he's even in those places and does his usual shtick. Then he shits on Ventus and makes him have a traumatic flashback on Destiny Islands. And instead of fighting him there, he says, go to the Keyblade graveyard or I'll kill Terra and Aqua. To which Ventus says, okay, I believe you and follows him there. I wouldn't even say his concept is interesting. First, what is the functional difference between him and the Unversed and the Heartless? They are literally the embodiments of the dark part of people's hearts, and the Unversed are… negative emotions? So they're the dark parts of people's hearts, again. This is a huge problem with the Kingdom Hearts franchise. The Heartless only became a threat to the worlds when Xehanort released them in his Ansem Seeker of Darkness form. Before that, they were mostly contained to the Realm of Darkness and Radiant Garden. That was literally the goal of the first game, to defeat Ansem and close the door to darkness, sealing away the Heartless. In Kingdom Hearts 2, though the Doors of Darkness were sealed away, they are still present but heavily weakened, due to the nature of sentient beings always having a bit of darkness in their hearts. But for all intents and purposes, they are only there because at some point the Door to Darkness was open, so before it was opened, before Ansem Seeker of Darkness did that, there were no Heartless except for in Radiant Garden. Right? So. Before Kingdom Hearts 1, there should be no enemies, logically speaking. They had to invent contrivances to give us enemies, with the Unversed in Birth by Sleep, and I guess that the Heartless in the mobile games are mere projections from the Book of Prophecies in Union Cross, whatever the fuck that's supposed to mean. And not only are the Unversed functionally identical to the Heartless, but they're also all cheap knockoffs of Heartless concepts. The Floods are modified shadows, Scrappers are modified soldiers, the Bruisers are modified large bodies. Instead of floating weird elemental things, you have floating elemental jars. Instead of air pirates, you have these birds. Setting aside how annoying these things are to deal with in-game, they have almost no originality to them, and none of the designs are even anything to write home about. Just let me ask this. Is the shadow an iconic design? Yes. How does the flood compare? Well, the answer is that it doesn't. It's just derivative. There are very few Unverse that I can even remember to any degree. There's the Valve guys, the birds, the ones that can go invisible or that teleport. And I only remember all of those because they're annoying in some way. And remember how I was supposed to be talking about Ventus' story? Huh. And remember how I said it was forgettable? Yeah. So. 
you get a tangent instead. So, basically, Ventus was originally the apprentice of Xehanort, who wanted to use him to forge the Kyblade. To this end, and because Ventus was very weak at the time, he separated the darkness from him completely, forming Vanitas. This fractured Ventus' heart, putting him into a comatose state. It's only by feeding off of someone else's light that he was able to reform his heart and become a person again. And this other person's light was Sora's. It's unclear how old Sora is this initial time, which makes the Wayfinder Trio's supposed connection even funnier. To me, one of two possibilities exist. Either this happened years in the future, meaning Sora was a literal infant at the time, which is really weird, or it happened recently when Sora was around four years old in Birth by Sleep, which is also weird because that implies Terra Ventus and Aqua haven't been friends for very long at all. According to the Kingdom Hearts wiki, the former is true, so Sora wasn't even a sentient thing when this happened, I guess. And we're not even gonna mention the mess that is Ventus' role in Union Cross that I read about over there. In any case, the events of the story happen, the Wayfinder trio confront Xehanort and Vanitas at the Keyblade Graveyard, Ventus, despite being an integral part of Xehanort's plan, is frozen and dropped like a thousand feet by Xehanort himself like a dumbass, and then Vanitas wins. He merges with Ventus, becoming the dominant personality in that body, and forms an incomplete Kyblade. But inside Ventus' heart, the two fight again, and Ventus successfully defeats Vanitas, destroying the partial Kyblade and fracturing his heart yet again. And just like before, it goes to Sora to recover, where it stays until Kingdom Hearts 3. So, Ventus' story does many things to the lore of the world, most prominently when wrapped up in the whole Kyblade nonsense. The Kyblade itself is a terrible idea conceptually, when you already have an all-powerful MacGuffin in Kingdom Hearts itself. That you suddenly need a special Keyblade to unlock it is just ridiculous, and serves to undermine the Keyblade as something special. At this point, in addition to the fact that every major character will have one going forward, it's just another sword, no more special than any other weapon in the series. No longer is it a matter of having a strong enough heart, it's just a matter of if you were chosen to be a successor. If the Keyblades were so prominent at one point, to where there are thousands of them left behind by their wielders from the Keyblade War, how in the hell is it possible for the other worlds to not know about them at least in some form? Are we led to assume that so much time has passed since the Keyblade War that every world's time flow has continued so far that none of them have any legends about Keyblade wielders who were supposedly far more powerful than those around today, sort of like the Jedi in the prequels compared to the original trilogy? The thing is, this sort of happens in the original game. The Final Fantasy crew and King Triton in Atlantica both know of the Keyblade, and the Villain Council also know of its power and that of the Keyholes. However, it stops there. Maleficent learns about the Keyblade from Xehanort in Birth by Sleep, and that's all this game does to establish the Disney folks learning about the Keyblade. No one else ever learns what it's called. If the Keyblade had been this legendary weapon that were sought after and had actual lore behind them, then that would be one thing and could have potentially been interesting, as the people you meet could maybe be trying to steal the Wayfinder trios, or at the very least they would have a reason to trust these random strangers can, say, stand up to the evil queen like the dwarves trust Aqua. I want to jump to the Stormlight Archives again here. In that series you have what are called Shard Blades and Shard Plates. Their existence is very similar to that of the Keyblades as explained in Birth by Sleep. There were originally many shard bearers in the form of the Knight's Radiance, just as there were many key bearers. Just like there are no longer many key bearers, there are also almost no Radiance in the world and those that are there remain in hiding and or don't understand their powers. However, when the Knights Radiant abandoned humanity, their shards didn't just disappear. They were all left behind, resulting in opportunistic people warring over their possession, and basically everything about current culture in the main country of Alethkar, from the division between Light Eyes and Dark Eyes, the correlation between shards and status, men and women diverging into their totally separate social paths when before they were all allowed to be whatever they want, that was all determined by the events of the Knights Radiant leaving behind their shards. In the present, shards are owned by the wealthy and powerful, and are used in wars, in political maneuvers, and in sports among the elite. Their trade and acquisition is a major aspect of many characters' backstories. Everyone in the world, regardless of culture, knows the power that shards have both on and off the battlefield. And the key aspect that's missing from the Kingdom Hearts franchise is the culture. There is no culture surrounding the Keyblade wielders, and no direct result on the larger world 
world that their existence brought, other than that it still exists because they kept the darkness at bay. They follow no tenets or rules, they have no code, and no identity. Their identity is solely based on what they own, rather than their character, as it was in the earlier entries. Back then, it took a certain type of person to wield the Keyblade, one pure of heart that had to be chosen by the weapon itself. Starting in Birth by Sleep, every character's only defining feature other than their base, baseline personality traits is that they can use a Keyblade. So when everyone uses a Keyblade, everyone loses their identity. Winding things back around to Ventus and the Kyblade, having a MacGuffin isn't an inherently bad thing in storytelling. One of the more prominent examples is in something like Pulp Fiction. It ultimately doesn't matter what's in the briefcase because the act of retrieving it is just an excuse to facilitate the dialogue and character work. The thing about a MacGuffin is that it's an inherently worthless object. It's a plot device of no more value than a gun that a character uses in the story. It's a tool to be used to facilitate something else that is worthwhile. What does the Kyblade facilitate? The answer is nothing. There's nothing gained by the inclusion of the Kyblade other than justifying Ventus's existence. If you have to invent a plot device in order to justify a character being there, that instantly tells me two things. The object didn't need to be there, and neither did the character. I would go so far as to say that the story would be immensely improved by the removal of Ventus, Vanitas, and the Kyblade. Have the Unverse come from Xehanort, or just bring the Heartless back with some stupid excuse for it, and have the story be about Terra and Aqua trying to fight against Xehanort's plan of stealing Terra's body. There. Done. Nice and simple. As is, Ventus offers nothing. He is only important to the plot and lore because of the many contrivances that his character existing introduces. Take away all of that and you still have essentially the same story, minus a bit of backstory. Xehanort will still want to open Kingdom Hearts and have his Keyblade War boner, and he'll still want Terra's body, and it would bring power back to the other Keyblades because you wouldn't need the stupid Kyblade to facilitate the unlocking of Kingdom Hearts. In truth, it feels like this game was trying to do too much for the Kingdom Hearts series. Assuming Kingdom Hearts 3 had to play out like it did, I feel like you needed to have one game which features Xehanort trying to take control of Terra's body, and then another game to establish the Kyblade and Ventus's role with it. With both occurring in the same game, it makes it so that proper development can't be done on either plot. Right before the final battle, the Wayfinder trio don't even know what the Kyblade is supposed to be. To them, it's just a nebulous concept that's vaguely frightening. This makes a certain amount of sense from Xehanort's perspective, as he doesn't want them to know too much about his plan, but in the context of this being a story that we're supposed to be invested in, it makes very little. The protagonists should know the full scope of the villain's plan if they're the only viewpoints that we get to see things through. From how things play out and in the execution of these scenes, it's clear that the game wasn't trying to be ambiguous. It just utterly failed at being specific. From this game alone, the Kyblade is a worthless object. It's formed and then is destroyed two minutes later by only two Keyblade wielders. Three, if you count Ventus fighting Vanitas in his own heart. So why are we supposed to be afraid of this thing? The only reason I can think of is that its formation has the inherent cost of Ventus' life, which requires me to actually be invested in Ventus' character, so it fails. As well, once again, we have that Catch-22. Ventus is created so that the Kyblade can be formed, and the Kyblade is only important in the game because of what it does in regards to Ventus' story. Which came first, and more importantly, which of them is more stupid? In the end, it doesn't matter because neither of them is any good. This is a campaign where 8 hours of it are spent either in gameplay or within Disney Worlds in general, another half hour is spent in menus, and an hour on cutscenes in Disney Worlds and relationship drama between the trio, leaving maybe half an hour to properly develop the whole Kyblade plot. It's given embarrassingly little screen time. And really, I could say that about the rest of the story as well. There are six hours and some change of cutscenes in Birth by Sleep, but it feels like five of them are dedicated to Disney World stuff. In Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, this makes sense, as the Disney World were still an integral part of the plot. However, in Birth by Sleep, they don't matter in the slightest. Their interactions with these different characters don't contribute anything to the larger story, they don't properly develop the trio on account of the nonlinear approach to going to them, and they're not enjoyable on top of that. 
Setting aside the meta reason for why this doesn't happen, if Ventus and Aqua made such big impacts on Phil and Hercules, you'd think they might have mentioned them in Kingdom Hearts 1 when Sora uses the Keyblade. Of course, that meta reason is entirely obvious, but you get my point. Let's take another prequel, Crisis Core, into consideration. In the original Final Fantasy VII, Zack is barely mentioned by anyone ever. Cloud's whole arc leads to him even remembering that he existed at all. Unlike Birth by Sleep, this makes some amount of sense. Zack was a loose end. His death and subsequent scrubbing from the history books was a deliberate decision on the part of Shinra. He was an embarrassment to them, a failure. They had to wipe him out or else it would risk their grabs for power, and Cloud forgot him as a result of the key traumatic event that led to where he is at the beginning of the adventure. In Birth by Sleep and the rest of the franchise, there is no such deliberate action or even a hand wave of destiny. The Wayfinder trio just aren't mentioned. Riku never mentioned that he saw a Keyblade before Kingdom Hearts 1. Sora never mentions his weird dreams where he takes Ventus's heart into his own to heal it, and he doesn't recognize Roxas as Ventus at the end of their fight because of course not. The only one where it makes sense is Kairi because it's explicitly stated in Kingdom Hearts 1 that she doesn't remember her time in Radiant Garden and thus wouldn't remember Kairi protecting her. It all just reeks of Nomura or whoever is coming up with these scenes not going back and researching what they already wrote into the series. The game was so obsessed with jacking off to the image of its younger self that it copied a scene almost word for word and beat for beat as the Wayfinder Trio's introduction. You know what it feels like? It feels like exactly what I've been saying about every Disney World plot. Bad fan fiction. And look, I've been going over both Terra and Ventus's story fairly extensively and pointing out what doesn't work about them for this, that, or the other reason, but if I wanted to, I could just not mention Aqua's part in the narrative because it's so inconsequential until the very tail end when she confronts Terra Xehanort in Radiant Garden. What seems to be the intended order of playable characters goes like this. You start with Terra's story, which is supposedly deeply personal, where we see his slow descent into darkness and eventually his downfall. He doesn't learn all that much about the world or the larger plot that's unfolding. He's singularly focused on Xehanort for most of the adventure. Then you move on to Ventus's story, where you find out that larger plot of Xehanort's plan of forging the Kyblade and why the Unversed are unleashed upon the worlds. Not everything is revealed and not all questions are answered, but the major ones are. Then Aqua's story is supposedly about finding out those other answers and gaining the full scope of the narrative from the perspective of someone on its periphery. Unfortunately, Aqua's story doesn't deliver on these in the slightest. Even right from the beginning, remember when Ericus is dicking over Terra and he says that Aqua is entitled to certain knowledge now that she's a Keyblade Master? Well, playing through Terra and Ventus' stories, I was waiting to learn about that knowledge in the final story. But we don't get to hear it! Instead, the scene jumps in at the tail end of the lecture where Aqua is spacing out, and then Yen Sid, not Ericus, rings the bell that summons Terra so he could track down Xehanort. This instance is a microcosm of Aqua's story. She is placed on this pedestal, treated like she's important and meaningful, but she does almost nothing of consequence while everyone around her does the important stuff which isn't helped by the fact that Aqua is the most boring character in the game. Setting aside Willa Holland's awful performance, which again, I don't think it's entirely her fault, Aqua just has no personality or emotion in her bones. A block of wood would be more charismatic than her, and I'm being serious. Let's take a look at her first Disney World. Cinderella has matched with the glass slipper, and all is well, except they're attacked by an unversed summoned by the evil stepmother's negative emotions. Aqua rushes in to help and save Cinderella, and then the unversed turns on the stepmother and her daughter, blowing them to bits with a bomb. Aqua doesn't react. She just stares at them, presumably burning alive, and say in the most bored and stoic voice, the darkness in their hearts overtook them. Nice. Way to make me really feel the weight of the moment and add to the tension of her very first boss fight. I'm so excited to play through the rest of her story. Much like Terra and Ventus, Aqua has exactly two moments in the game that I kind of liked her. And unfortunately, neither of them were actual key story moments. 
First was, ironically, in Cinderella World. She's shrunken down by the fairy godmother to help Jacques unlock Cinderella's door so she can try the glass slipper. With that done, she's waiting in Minnie for Cinderella. And when it seems like it's too late, she tries to go down the stairs, grows, and falls comically. Then she does a comedic look up as everyone is staring at this maniac, and she then thinks on her feet and asks to try the slipper herself. That was an okay moment for her, which showed how out of her element she could get in these Disney worlds, and shows us that despite her relative naivete with the outside world, she is capable of adaptation. The second moment was in Olympus, and for those that played the game, I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about. Unfortunately, it's another pandering moment, where Aqua is asked on a date by Zack, and she gets super flustered. It's the only time in the entire game where she feels like an actual human being with emotions. Of course, it doesn't help that this is just a copy of the scene from Crisis Core, which is itself a copy of the scene from the original Final Fantasy VII, which is weird because Cloud was channeling Zack's persona when Zack chronologically did the scene first, but in the meta he did- never mind. Within her role as the Obi-Wan of the trio, Aqua fails on almost every level. She isn't any wiser or worldly than Terra, and is constantly put on the back foot in her interactions with him and Ventus. The only times I can recall when she isn't acting super defensive around them or demanding they obey her is when she blindly tells Ven that Terra would never do that, despite not knowing what Maleficent was even accusing him of, and the opening tutorial cutscenes. She isn't portrayed as any stronger either, at least compared to Terra. She manages to get him on the back foot during their duel, but we don't get to see the conclusion of that, and they seem more or less even after that little moment. Then she confronts Vanitas, twice, and after the encounters, she's either left panting or she literally passes out from exhaustion. Meanwhile, Terra is over here curb stomping Ericus and fighting both Xehanort and Venetus without any visible signs of fatigue, and this is after suffering all of this abuse earlier. If the idea was that Aqua wasn't stronger and was completely out of her depth as a Keyblade Master, where her journey is supposed to be her struggling and eventually rising to the occasion and finally embodying the ideal of a master, then it completely fails because nothing like that happens. There certainly seems to be what they were going for, I guess, as Aqua's big moment at the end of the final episode is her declaring herself as Master Aqua for the first time. Unfortunately, she's never portrayed as being out of her depth. She's constantly painted as this hyper-competent warrioress who always knows the right thing to do and is sickeningly self-assured and confident, sometimes to the point of parody, such as when she declares that she'll fight both Hades and the Ice Titan at the same time, despite Zack being right there and begging to let him help her. As for her role in the final battle, she has next to nothing to do. She makes a barrier for Terra in the cutscene, she beats the Grunt Brag, and then is knocked out by Vanitas so Ventus can have his moment. Great. I just want to say that again. The Master Keyblade wielder, the only one of the three to actually become a master, is knocked out like a bitch. We're not even going to touch the possible misogynistic aspect of the guy having to save the girl again, despite the fact that she should be way stronger than him. Let's just leave it at the titles. Just wow. That's... That's something else. Anyway, after that, she worked with Mickey to defeat Vanitas in Ventus's body, but his defeat, as we know from Ventus's story, is largely due to Ventus overcoming Vanitas in his own heart and destroying the incomplete Kyblade, so she can't really be given credit for that either. From there, she hides Ventus in the Land of Departure, and we apparently learn that the certain knowledge that Aqua was entitled to upon becoming Master only amounts to using Ericus's Keyblade to turn the Land of Departure into Castle Oblivion, which... Okay, neat, I guess. It doesn't really make that much sense, but this game has come up with stupider concepts before. It's also extremely disappointing that this is the knowledge that we've been waiting the entire game to find out, as it wasn't even anything like universal about the nature of the cosmos. It was just this very specific technique for an event that was very unlikely to happen, which just so happened to occur in the game, because it's convenient that way. Then, she stumbles upon Terra Xehanort in Radiant Garden, and there is no explanation for how he got from the Keyblade Graveyard to Radiant Garden. They could have made up something like they did to link Twilight Town to the world that never was, like they did in Kingdom Hearts 2, but no, they obviously didn't want to repeat themselves, so we got nothing instead. Aqua beats Terra Xehanort, who falls into a pool which randomly spawns, which would take him to the Realm of Darkness, I guess, which Aqua doesn't even know about, by the way, at least as far as what 
what this game tells us. Aqua dives in after him and sacrifices herself to save Terra Xehanort, dooming the world twice as a result, but again, it's a heroic moment, at least that's how it's framed. Right, I forgot, it was because of friendship. So obviously it was the right decision. In the secret episode, a final mix exclusive, we see Aqua between the cutscene with the dark sides and when she gets to the dark depths and talks to Diz, where she's wandering the realm of darkness. Nothing interesting happens other than that she fights Heartless and has a really bullshit boss. The level design is a little bit better, but other than that, there is absolutely nothing to speak of. And then we have Blank Points, which is considered by fans to be the true ending of the game. In it, we see snippets of events that lead to the rest of the series, such as Bray getting all chummy with Xehanort, who is now Diz's protege, as well Aqua meets Diz at the Dark Depths sometime after the events of Kingdom Hearts 2, which is the bulk of the scene. Diz was thrust back into the Realm of Darkness after his supposed death in that game, and has found his way to the Dark Depths, where Aqua wanders into him. He explains to her that the worlds nearly fell to ruin twice and that a boy wielding a keyblade managed to protect the light in her absence. Aqua wonders if it was Terra or Ventus, but Diz denies this, and says that the boy might be able to open the right door and fix all of the things he's sent to ruin, and that he's touched the hearts of many people. Then Aqua asks what his name is, and we see all of the people that Sora has saved or has become a part of through his adventures. Namine, Roxas, Axel, Shion, Terra, Ventus, and finally Aqua, who all say his name with longing and relief before fading to Sora on Destiny Islands after the ending of Kingdom Hearts 2, letter in a bottle in his hand. Riku and Kairi meet him, and he proclaims that he has to go on another journey to help these people, to which Kairi gives him her good luck charm once again, setting the events of future games properly into motion. Blank Points is legitimately a great ending to this game, and does a better job setting up Kingdom Hearts 3 than Dream Drop Distance would ever, well, dream of. I was talking with my buddy Ian the other day, and we concluded that Kingdom Hearts works best as a series when it focuses on the emotions of the characters, and trying to ignore or sweep under the rug the technical aspects of the world and the setting. And in terms of emotional payoff, seeing all of these seemingly disparate characters calling Sora to his next adventure is incredibly powerful, and expertly plays to the series' strengths in a way that the vast majority of this game simply doesn't. I really have nothing but good things to say about Blank Points, and it deserves all of the praise it receives. Well, except for that the voice direction is terrible, but I can forgive that just this once. And with that, my friends, we come to the second to last section of this video. Finally, after all of this time, we come to the big gameplay analysis of Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Now I could do this in several ways. I could go through all of the story encounters and talk about things either as they come up or to fill empty spaces as I did in Kingdom Hearts 2, or I could make like a bullet point list and go through each aspect individually like I did with the Final Fantasy VII Remake one year later video. The thing is, absolutely none of the bosses are worth talking about, which is surprising. Here I was, thinking I didn't have a lot to say about the unique bosses in Days, but this is on a whole other level. The thing is, in Days, you had to pick your speciality. You could be a mage, or you could be a melee fighter, or you could be an all-rounder, or specialize in air combat, or ground combat, or what have you. In Birth by Sleep, you can do everything all of the time. Through the dealing system, you have access to whatever playstyle you could ever want or need at any given circumstance, and there are several options that are universal across all three characters, namely reprisals and shot locks. Shot locks are something I've already gone over in some depth with Terra, but in short, they are the equivalent of limits in this game. You hold a shoulder button to bring up this reticle, and when the center lines up with an enemy, you get a hit, of which the maximum varies from shot lock to shot lock. If you don't get the maximum number of hits before unleashing it, you just do those hits and then it ends, but if you max it out, and then if the shot lock is path level 1, you can do a QTE to do additional hits, which again vary from shot lock to shot lock. Given that getting the maximum number of hits is very easy when a shot lock is at max level, and because you're fully invincible during its duration, these attacks are incredibly spammable tools that make a joke out of almost every boss encounter in the game, which is the main reason why I'm not going over them. Even assuming you don't use shot locks, every boss has a very simple pattern that's rarely that threatening save for the possibility of a wombo combo before you get second chance and once more. The key to defeating bosses in this game isn't in learning their patterns or being a good player. The key is spamming invincible moves or zoning the boss with ranged spells. 
These two options are, again, highly spammable with magic hastes especially, which leads to command styles, which leads to command style finishers that can deal tremendous damage and, once again, are invisible, at which point the cycle repeats. It's not like you're sacrificing damage to do this either. The more advanced commands, such as Time Splicer with Aqua, Geo Impact for Terra, or Salvation for Ventus, don't really do much more damage, are slower to come out, and aren't safe whether on hit or whiff, usually resulting in a trade which never benefits the player. As such, as I said earlier, the Surge commands are fantastic. They do good damage, cover good distance, and are very safe. Likewise, Fyraga, Thundaga, Blizzaga, and especially Magnega and the Mind spells are extremely spammable. And believe it or not, I've just gone over the primary strategies for all four of the super bosses in BBSFM. Vanitas Remnant, Mind Abilities and Healing Items instead of Cure, Mysterious Figure, Surges and Pick a God and Pray, Armor of the Master, Shotlock Spam, no heart, spam mine abilities. I'm not even gonna go over them more than that because there was absolutely nothing to go over. I beat all four in about 20 minutes. The only reason you would actually need to learn those fights is if you're attempting them as Terra, because unlike Ventus and Aqua, he doesn't have an invincible dodge. Unfortunately, even if you do know the fights, each of the three characters, without fail, are far too slow and floaty to properly deal with them without either a great deal of luck or a great deal of cheese. It's widely considered by the fanbase that the Mysterious Figure is the single worst boss in the entire Kingdom Hearts franchise, a series which also had Joke Pete, the gimmick bullshit air battle in the Caribbean, Clayton, the Dust Flyer, and Vexen's absent silhouette. That's a huge statement, and it's one I very much agree with. Many people have said it before, but more than anything, luck is your greatest asset in that fight. What moves does the mysterious figure spam in that attempt? Do you get caught by some trap when you're healing? Do once more second chance or leaf razor randomly fail? And does he randomly put up his shield and heal off all of your damage? There is next to no strategy in that battle other than learning to recognize the one or two moves that are safe to attack him after with surges. Using anything else is a futile effort. With the super bosses out of the way, let's get back to the gameplay analysis in earnest. Earlier in the video, I made a few statements that command styles are the worst part of the combat system and that shot locks are the second worst. We've already gone over shot locks and why they were a bad inclusion. They simply trivialize too much of the game for next to no cost. Command styles are bad because they occur against the player's will and break up the flow of the fight far too much. But what are command styles? Well, they are BBS's answer to drive forms. They are heightened states that the characters enter when certain conditions are met. In Kingdom Hearts 2, drive forms are selectable from the menu and come at the cost of slow building drive bars. In Birth by Sleep, each hit, whether from a physical attack or from a command, fills up the command gauge. And if any condition to enter any command style are met, then that character automatically enters that state when the bar is full. If none of the conditions are met, read only filling it up with physical attacks, then the character will use whatever finisher they have selected instead. Inside of the command style, the player's attack command changes to Surge and later Storm in Tier 2 command styles, but that's literally the only thing that's changed. You're still just doing a regular physical attack, just buffed. Your attacks might do a bit more damage, but they're also much slower and have much wonkier hitboxes. In addition, the changed moves, namely the launchers for Ventus and Aqua, are significantly worse than their defaults, as well as them straight up removing some moves, such as attacks that lower the player in the air. Let's take Ventus. In his default state, he has a launching uppercut, and then his downward slash that tracks fairly well to an enemy if he overshoots it. It's not ideal in that the launcher's height seems random at times, but it works more often than it doesn't. Then, in his command styles, his launcher more often than not sends him a thousand feet into the air, and he no longer has a lowering attack, meaning he just flails uselessly above the enemy. The only reliable way to get air combos in command styles is to do a stupid little hop and then attack to forego the launcher entirely. In many ways, command styles actively discourage the player from doing anything creative. The second you get into a rhythm with your commands, the game just stops so that the player can do their little flourish to enter the command style. And sometimes, it's not even the style that you want. Let's say that you want to enter the Firestorm command style, but you only have one fire-based command in your deck. The only surefire way to enter the form is to use the command, wait, maybe take a pot shot or two to keep the gauge from going down, and then use the fire command again when it recharges, resulting in a whole ton of waiting around and wasting time. But if you use a fire spell and then hit a thunder on like three enemies by accident, you're probably going into Thunderbolt instead of Firestorm. The fundamental problem with the command style system is the lack of transparency with how it works, and this is a problem that will become even worse come Kingdom Hearts 3. 
We simply don't know what factors affect the end result of the command gauge. We don't know if higher tier spells have more weight when determining the end result, or if it's based on the number of hits done with each different element, or what. All we know is that using fire-based commands tends to activate Firestorm, thunder-based commands tends to activate Thunderbolt, and so on. For now though, let's set that aside and talk about just how disappointing and boring they are. Like, okay, Valorform was just hit things with two sticks and Final Form was just going Super Saiyan, but dude, Master Form was so cool with its infinite magic and insane single target finisher. Even in general, the forms changed how your spells functioned to fit with the flow of the form that you were in, or it was replaced with something else like in Limit Form. Command styles are, pardon the pun, all style, no substance. Going into a command style doesn't change how you play in any significant way, other than forcing you to do that stupid little hop to hit aerial enemies. And I think what's most damning about them is that they don't even matter. A casual player would never choose to go into any specific command style. When your base kit of spamming commands and shot locks is so powerful anyway, why would you actually want to go into a command style? It literally stops you from doing anything for like 2 seconds every 5 seconds, and it's not like your commands or movements is any stronger when in a style. The only exception to this is really Aqua level 1 speedruns, where speedrunners specifically go into Spellweaver and decimate bosses with its finisher for, like, the whole game. I feel like this boredom could have been avoided if they did something similar to Grand Magic as seen in Kingdom Hearts 3. In that game, filling up the situation gauge allows the use of higher tier spells based on what you filled up the gauge with, and eventually, or immediately with cufflinks equipped, you gain access to spells that are stronger than any that you can regularly cast. If they tuned the command styles to power up a corresponding element or command type, then I would probably be fine with them, because it would incentivize players to optimize and build their decks specifically around a command style and to take full advantage of its buffs. For example, in Firestorm, your dodge could gain a fire property, just like the existing fire roll that Ventus has, but keeping all the iframes of regular dodge roll. You could have all of your fire spells buffed to have a Fission Fireaga property, which is a fire spell that explodes in an AoE on contact, with higher tier spells having a corresponding finding explosion size. So base fire could have a small explosion, fire could be what fission fireaga has normally, and fireaga could have an explosion that's even bigger. And then fission fireaga could turn into like a mini mega flare or something else to keep its value. Fireaga burst could last longer while giving the player full movement during its duration. Fire surge could have a wider area of effect or an optional follow-up attack that hits in like a downward slash with like a fire beam coming out or whatever. I thought of these in like 3 seconds as I was writing this, and I'm sure I could do something similar with the other command styles. The tricky ones would be those that don't have a specific element attached, but like, Ghost Drive could cause copies to simultaneously attack when you use a physical command, Fever Pitch could grant a passive haste buff like Ventus's D-Link provides, but apply it to everything and not just physical attacks, Critical Impact would guarantee critical hits on all attacks, Spellweaver could bump up any spells to the next highest tier, and so on and so forth. I'm not opposed to offering suggestions in games, which you might be able to tell, but I know some people get squeamish about doing so. Unfortunately, when there's nothing here to dig into, the only solution really is to add something. And that's the problem with command styles. They simply don't benefit the player in any meaningful way in any aspect or method of play. They're too simple. They don't alter the way you play the game and they don't excite on a mechanical level. And Birth by Sleep in general is very much not a rock paper scissors game of elemental weaknesses and strategy on the deck building side of things. So they don't offer the player any substantial edge in combat in that way either. The only way that command styles might be good is in the visual aspect, but all that usually amounts to is flashier attack animations that take much longer by the way, and an aura around the character. Yay. Neat. So if command styles are a bust and shot locks are more boring versions of limits, then what else is there to be excited about in combat? Well, we have physical attacks and the command system. Physical attacks have nothing interesting to them. Like all other handheld Kingdom Hearts games, there are no combo modifiers, so you're stuck with whatever the character does at the beginning of the game. The combos themselves are functional, but unimpressive. Yes, each character attacks in a slightly different way and with different timings, but in the end, they all have a 3-hit ground combo and a 3-hit air combo. Combo plus abilities just add hits as per usual and don't offer anything interesting either. On a small tangent though, there does seem to be some strangest going on with Ventus his ground finisher. It's clearly supposed to hit at the end of his spin, and it even does this like 10% of the time, but more often than not he hits at the beginning of his animation, leaving the player doing a nice little twirl for the style points I guess. 
I mean, this is a nitpick. In the end, it doesn't affect his comboing abilities in any notable way. It's just strange and is most likely a frame data error, which is hilarious that they have not fixed it after like five re-releases of this game, but whatever. Regular physical combos obviously gives way into finishers, which is a special attack that you can do if you fill up the command gauge without meeting requirements for any of the different command styles. They are, again, unimpressive. Ventuses especially are just useless if you're sticking with his main line, and everything else is just a regular attack. The only difference is that all finishers are invincible, which is nice, but more often than not, using a command will yield more damage and a stronger advantage against enemies. And for as much as I just shit on command styles, command style finishers are infinitely better in both range and damage when compared to regular finishers. As for the commands themselves, this is going to be the bulk of how you'll be spending the game, either spamming them in combat or building a deck with them. We'll start with the former. So you start the game with three command deck slots, or five on critical mode, and you can place whatever commands in them that you want. Unlike in Recoded, there is no limit on how powerful of commands you can stack your deck with, save for the number of open slots you have available. Some of the quote unquote more powerful commands take up two slots, but these are hardly ever worth it with the exception of Mega Flare. I mentioned this briefly before, but later stage commands are very slow to come out, and none of them have invincibility, making them all unsafe, whether on whiff, which usually leads to you getting hit, or on hits, which usually leads to a trade where both you and the enemy hit each other. Especially on critical mode, trading hits with an enemy is never beneficial to the player because of your smaller health pool compared to every other entity in the adventure. Because of this lack of safety, it's much safer to spam spells, which are very fast to come out, or mid-stage commands like the surges due to their invincibility. So right there, you have already invalidated a large amount of the potential fun to come out of the command deck system. There is no mechanical enjoyment to be found from later spells or attacks, so the benefit should be a noticeable increase in damage without a deficit in safety. And this simply isn't the case, so the system becomes either extremely boring or extremely frustrating when getting to the late game because you either stick to the good and safe commands or you try and fail to use the late stage ones. Looking back at Recoded, the late stage commands work better for a number of reasons. First, that game has proper hit stun on its enemies, which Birth by Sleep lacks. Second, they're either fast to come out or they attack in a very large area, so you're safe either way when you use them. In addition, late stage commands in Birth by Sleep fill up the command gauge a lot, resulting in you having to stop and enter like 70 different command styles if you get them to work, which also isn't a problem in Recoded or even Dream Drop Distance as we'll see. Though admittedly that game has its own very glaring issues in the command department, but for now that's just hot air to me, so we'll come back to BBS. You might argue that the fun of the late stage commands like our Solum is to time it properly and then be rewarded with tons of damage. Now that might be the case in a good game like Kingdom Hearts 2, but BBS, as I've mentioned, does not have proper hit stun. I talked about this fairly extensively in my Kingdom Hearts 2 video in Halloween Town's first visit. Basically, Kingdom Hearts games need proper hit stun to function well in its current style. Until Kingdom Hearts 3, with the exception of Recoded and Kingdom Hearts 2 with Reflect, there is no instant defensive option that you can use on the fly. This means that when you hit an enemy, they need to stagger. If they don't stagger, they can initiate their attack after you start yours and hit you before your attack goes off. And that is the core problem with the late stage commands. Since they're so slow to come out, enemies don't even need to be unfairly fast to do this and punish you for using the move. In addition, most bosses have random super armor, so with them, it isn't even a matter of timing or that they never stagger so never use that move. Sometimes they stagger, and sometimes they don't, and there's no way, especially for a casual player, to figure out what determines this. You simply cannot use our Solum on Ericus or Xehanort safely. It's impossible due to that random factor. You can't use Time Splicer on Terra Xehanort or the final Heartless boss as Aqua, nor Ars Arcanum on final Vanitas as Ventus. Thus, on higher difficulties, when eating bullshit retaliatory hits often simply kills you, the only somewhat reliable option is spamming invincible commands like the surges or just use shot locks. This is exactly why, out of the three, Terra's story was the easiest for me and Aqua's was the hardest. With the exception of the final Heartless boss in the Secret episode, I refused to use shot locks on bosses in Aqua's story, in the hopes that I would come to appreciate them, which, side note, failed spectacularly as I grew to dislike them even more upon analysis. 
Whereas with Terra, I spammed Ragnarok like there was no tomorrow, and only ever had to fight fair against Brag and Terra Xehanort, both of which were beaten by Terra's reprisal almost exclusively. I never grinded levels with any of the characters, and as Ventus especially, I was often doing chip damage, but Shotlocks as Terra still decimated every single boss. It was pathetic. Now should I even mention the command melding system? I guess I have to, but I really don't have much to say. Basically, commands gain levels via CP that you get from killing unversed. When at a high enough level, compatible commands can be combined to form a stronger one. So two fires can make a fire up, for example. You can also attach a crystal, which are dropped by enemies, to attach an ability to that command. Then when you equip that command, you'll gain that ability, and when the command has a maxed out level, that ability becomes permanent. Much like the stat matrix from Recoded, there's no way to properly judge what you're going to get before before you take the plunge. Sure, with recipes that you find in chests, you can find out the command you'll get, but as for what ability you'll get, you're up shit creek without a paddle. And it's not like the end result of Fyra will always have the same ability attached. No, that would be too simple. Instead, it's based on what commands you use to create the Fyra, and different combinations of commands yield different abilities when using the same crystal. So basically, if you use two Fyras to make a Fyraga, it would get a different ability with the same crystal if you used one Fyra and one base fire command. So you end up going online and seeing one of these ridiculously complex lists of which command combos yield which commands and which of those yield which ability for which crystal you attach to it. And I just, God, this is horseshit. I hated it and recoded and I liked that game. But with this, I sometimes found it really hard to find the motivation to manage my deck at all. It's definitely not undoable. I actually think it's more unnecessary work to manage materia in the Final Fantasy VII remake, but still it's taken about two steps too far for my tastes. But even beyond all of that, in terms of the balancing of the commands, the stupid command melding system, the shot locks, all of it, the moment to moment gameplay and the gameplay loop of leveling up and melding commands are both boring. And that's really all I have to say. It's boring as sin, and going through this game was the biggest chore of the series thus far. And that's including spending almost 6 hours each grinding synthesis materials in both Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2. I had thought that playing on critical mode would at least provide a fun challenge, but more often than not, my deaths were a result of wombo combos that I couldn't predict. And when I played the same way the next time, I lived. So there. Before I move off of gameplay, I want to mention one more thing. This doesn't really affect my enjoyment of the combat in this game, but an interesting thing to note is that this game does have dodge cancelling, in that you can cancel out of an action by dodging. However, there are issues with this, such as Terra's dodge in general being useless, and that you can't immediately act out of a dodge anyway, so it doesn't benefit you to do this. I died a couple of times to this as well. But guys, for the final stretch of this video, I want to do some theory crafting. I went on for some time about why the story and characters in Birth by Sleep don't work. Personally, when I see something like this, I think it's fun not only to shit all over it, but also to think of ways to improve it. More than anything, it feels like this game needed another careful draft to flesh out the details and breathe more life into the characters past their baseline traits. So, I've gone ahead and made an outline detailing what I would do with this second draft. And it's a lot, so buckle in. <sighs> to start, we're keeping all of the changes that we talked about earlier. The Keyblades are now splinters of the Kyblade, the Mark of Mastery is partially subjective and partially a test to see the strength of one's heart to keep the borrowed Keyblade when it's called back to its original owner. From here, we're going to add some backstory to the trio and change some of how they work. Terra is an outsider to the Land of Departure. He was a boy with a strong heart from a world that was swallowed by darkness. Using the power of the Keyblade, Ericus revived him and took him in as his own, teaching him to wield the Keyblade. His personality will be tweaked to match what other characters say about him in the game already, and how he sort of acts in the flashbacks. A naive but ultimately driven and hardworking young man with a lust for power. He blames himself for his world being swallowed by the darkness, and so wants power however he can get it in order to prevent that from happening again. To this end, he begins to dabble in dark powers that lurk in his heart, willingly, to prevent the darkness from going out of control and swallowing another world. He trains alongside Aqua, and they're frequently visited by Master Xehanort and his apprentice, Ventus, whom they get along with. During these visits, Xehanort encourages Terra to use the darkness within him should he need it, but warns him not to become reliant on it. Xehanort wants Terra to be vulnerable to his own dark influence without becoming more powerful than him, if that makes sense. Ventus's backstory will remain the same, except that he knew Terra and Aqua before his memory wipe. 
That wipe also happens much more recently, so Vanitas is younger than in canon. Instead of bonding with an infant Sora, Ventus's heart reaches back out to Vanitas, who subconsciously reciprocates, forming an even closer bond between them. To this end, they are aware of each other's existence and presence subconsciously, and their emotions and bodies feed off of one another. So when one is angry, the other becomes more aggressive, and when one gets hurt, the other feels the same pain. Aqua is now the biological daughter of Ericus, who was trained from birth. She trained alongside Terra, but was the only one of the two to witness when Xehanort maimed Ericus. In this version, Xehanort was banished from the Land of Departure after the incident, in this canon happening when Aqua was around 9 or 10. And afterwards, he and Yen Sid have kept tabs on Xehanort to make sure he doesn't do anything dangerous. This violent use of darkness affects Aqua dramatically, making her afraid of it and its use. It also causes her to have a very black and white view of the world. Light is good, darkness is bad. If you really want to, we can also add a romance subplot between her and Terra, which might help add drama to her conflicting feelings on him and his use of darkness, but I don't think it's entirely necessary. Ericus would be more overtly flawed. The game doesn't really frame him well at all, but almost none of what they do do is negative in the opening cutscenes, and even that doesn't have any ramifications because his view of Terra turned out to be exactly correct because Terra kills him. In this new version, Ericus is more openly prejudiced against those who use the darkness, and also has a very black and white view, much like Aqua. In this version, he doesn't fail Terra for failing to control the darkness, but rather that he uses darkness at all, you feel me? Xehanort will match the intentions that Kingdom Hearts 3 eventually retcons into him. He's not some crazy, egomaniacal monster who wants to recreate the universe. He's a man who honestly believes that he's keeping the balance. In the past, he was constantly on the back foot with Ericus, being weaker than him, older and frailer, and generally on the losing side. Seeing that light has completely swallowed the other half of the cosmos, Xehanort takes it upon himself to study and understand darkness. He also doesn't attack Ericus unprovoked. He explains to him that the world is unbalanced and that darkness has to rise and meet the light that has taken over everything. When Ericus strikes at him, Xehanor does what he has to do to defend himself. Eventually, as he takes on the entirety of the darkness in the worlds, even he succumbs to its influence. No longer is he controlling it, but it's controlling him, morphing his behavior to align more with what we see in the games. Now okay, what would these changes accomplish? Why change Aqua to have the biological connection to Ericus? Well, it's to really emphasize the family dynamic between all six major characters. Terra, Ventus, and Aqua are more like siblings now than friends, Vanitas is the cousin that only shows up at family gatherings, Ericus is the stern father, and Xehanort is the estranged uncle. A family dynamic isn't something that's been really focused on in the series up to this point, though Birth by Sleep does pay lip service to the idea at times, especially in the Japanese version. Putting it so starkly would differentiate the Wayfinder trio from the Wanderlust trio, whom they're too similar to at the moment. It would also enhance the drama that's already present in the story by adding context and character arcs with nuanced motivations. We now know why Terra was so hellbent on gaining power and becoming a master. We now know why Aqua has this black and white outlook on the world, etc. As for big storyline changes, I would add sprinkles here and there to help the pacing, and I wouldn't have a Vanitas fight until the final battle, save for perhaps gauging Ventus' strength without the intent to kill him, or if we have to have one, I would have it be unprovoked, so one of the trio ambushes and attacks him rather than the other way around as in the game now. I would also have him appear more often, not as a villain, but as an ally. Let's think about this for a second. As the other half of Ventus, the unbroken half no less, he should have all of Ventus's memories, so he would remember when Xehanort wasn't so obsessed and power hungry. He's new to the world, he's irritable and angry by nature, but he's naive. As he goes around to the different worlds, he could be spreading the disease of the unversed accidentally, at least at first. He could run into the trio and then interact with them on a more meaningful level. He only really knows about his connection with Ventus, but Terra and Aqua? He knows them through Ventus's memories, but they sure don't know him, which would create some wonderful mental whiplash moments, as Vanitas forms these connections that are wholly distinct from Ventus's, causing him to question if he's his own person or just an extension of Ventus. He would form a kind of love-hate relationship with Terra over their respective dark powers. Terra could either be frightened or jealous of Vanitas's control over it, while he has the one-up on Vanitas when it comes to life experience. Aqua could use Vanitas as a springboard to overcome her fear of the darkness, and make her start to challenge her own worldview. She could come to blows with a confused Vanitas, who likely assumed they were friends from the memories he has, only to eventually form a bond with the misfit, helping him control his emotions, and maybe even start to sway him to the side of light. Ugh. 
This would culminate in an identity crisis. Both Ventus and Vanitas are halves of a whole. Both have formed their own connection with Terra and Aqua, and both want to hold on to that unique connection while becoming whole again. Vanitas could fall under the delusion that he was the original personality, and deserved the happiness that Ventus's old life brought him. This would lead into the final battle, which now has the story significance of the clash to form the Kai Blade, and also the personal stakes between the two characters. Terra would follow much the same structural path as he does now, however there would be some order changes. Namely, the Maleficent encounter would be moved to after Radiant Garden to better fit with the mood that he's experiencing in that portion of the game. Now, this might come across as random for now, but for the sake of symbolism, I'm going to say that black armband he wears is a memento from his world, and looking at it reminds him of why he's fighting. Just trust me on that. In the beginning, when Terra has much more of a handle on his dark powers, he is more or less able to see the villains for what they are, as he does with the evil queen in Dwarf Woodlands. Then, at Radiant Garden, we actually have a mid-story twist. Terra would run into Xehanort before meeting with Ventus and Aqua, and learn that in Xehanort's early experiments with darkness, he was chiefly responsible for the destruction of Terra's home world. Not on purpose, though in his deranged state he would probably play it off that way. Xehanort would reveal this information in order to feed Terra's descent into darkness, and now he would be hellbent on finding Xehanort and taking his revenge. This sudden obsession would lead directly to the falling out between him and the other members of the trio, as he would no longer hold back any bitterness he felt at being snubbed for the role of master. He strikes out on his own and resolves to find Xehanort and kill him. Within this badge of worlds, Terra allows himself to step closer and closer to the darkness, resulting in his becoming vulnerable to the temptation of those who use it, namely Maleficent. However, he also has encounters with Vanitas, Ventus, and Aqua, and through their interactions, realizes that he may have been acting rashly when he separated from them, and that maybe getting revenge isn't the right answer right now when his friends need him. To this end, when he eventually reunites with the rest of the Wayfinder trio, he makes it a point to cast off his black armband that memento, symbolizing his finally moving past the destruction of his world and, with his Wayfinder clutched in his hand, embracing the newfound bond he's formed with the other members of the trio. After the Disney stuff is done, he meets up with Ventus and Aqua, where Ventus tells them that he knows who, or rather what, he is, and they all return to the Land of Departure to work something out with Ericus to keep Ventus safe from Xehanort. However, Ericus, as he did with Xehanort, jumps to conclusions and strikes at Ventus, ordering Terra and Aqua to stand aside. Terra jumps into the fray, taps into his dark power, and though Ericus orders Aqua to stop him, all she does is help Ventus through a portal and leave him to his fate. Terra defeats Ericus, but displays enough control to leave him alive. They have a heart-to-heart, -heart where Ericus says how proud Terra makes him for rising above the old guard and their archaic ways, only to be struck down by Xehanort. Xehanort's plan had been for Terra to succumb and take Ericus's life, but obviously that didn't pan out. With the murder of his father figure and mentor, Terra resolves to do whatever it takes to kill Xehanort for taking both his old home and his new one. He meets with Aqua and Ventus in the Keyblade Graveyard, Q final battle, more or less how it happens in the game, with some exceptions that I'll go into more as we dive into the other characters. Moving right along, Ventus' story is also relatively unchanged. In this version, we'll say that Terra ran off on his own to find Xehanort and defeat Unversed in an attempt to impress Ericus, against the Master's wishes. This provides a reason that he wouldn't tell Ventus where he's going in that stupid scene, as then the others would know what he's trying to do and even might know where he would go first. Ventus then goes after him, cue the rest of the game. Ventus's big mystery would be why he can wield a Keyblade outside of the Land of Departure. Remember, in this new canon, the pupil should only be able to wield a Keyblade when in the Land of Departure, as per the rules set by the whole splintering of the Keyblades, gifting the Keyblades, you know, all that stuff. So when Ventus is younger and less experienced than the other members of the trio, how can he have a strong enough heart to retain it? Well, as he runs into the others and works with them to help the worlds deal with the unversed, that question is brought up frequently. Also throughout the worlds, Ventus keeps having flashbacks to before he was separated from Vanitas, perhaps triggered by his exposure to the outside world. For now, he'll write these memories off as memories from after his coma rather than before. It's only when Ventus encounters Vanitas for the first time, where Vanitas might test his strength resulting in a boss fight, that he learns that Ericus wasn't his first master, it was Xehanort, and that Vanitas was the half of him that the master chose to keep. 
From there, Ventus's faith in Terra and Aqua is shaken, as they flat out lied to him for however much time it's been since his coma. And because he can no longer know which memories are real and which ones are from the person he was before Vinius separated from him, he sees the Ventus from before the incident as a completely different entity. This contributes to the falling out between the trio, which is only mended as they meet up in pairs in the second batch of worlds. In the end, Ventus recovers the full scope of his memories, conveniently right as Vanitas is having his identity crisis. He reconciles Vanitas existence as being the representation of the trauma he suffered and offers Vanitas a hand in friendship, which he refuses out of spite. Vanitas tries to strike Aventus, who is forced to avoid the conflict lest the Kyblade be forged. Terra intervenes after his own second batch of worlds and causes Vanitas to run. Cue them meeting up with Aqua, going to see Ericus, and that whole scene. On Destiny Islands, with Aqua this time instead of Vanitas, Ventus casts off the Keyblade that he now knows is from his time training with Xehanort, and instead summons one of his own, maybe from Ericus or from Terra and Aqua's strong hearts. Cue final battle. As for Aqua, she would follow a similar path as well. You might notice I'm trying to make as few structural changes as possible here to keep with the game's overall flow. Born in the Land of Departure as Ericus' daughter, she is given a pendant by him not unlike Kyrie's that's supposed to keep her safe. She carries it with her, religiously. She sees Terra and Ventus leave the Land of Departure and is told by Ericus to retrieve the both of them. However, as she runs into them, she's unable to do so for this, that, or the other reason. It could be that she becomes so focused on helping the world that she lets them get away, or doesn't notice them just simply leaving without her. Her character arc would be in overcoming her fear of the darkness, and coming to recognize it not as the evil counterpart to the light, but rather just the other side of the coin. To this end, she realizes that both light and darkness, when taken as absolutes and allowed to run rampant, can both corrupt and destroy innocent life. Vanitas will play a large role in this transformation along with Terra. As the game progresses, Aqua forms a sisterly relationship with Vanitas, as she tries to guide him through his identity angst and acknowledges him as an individual. As she begins overcoming her fear and prejudice, she even starts to have feelings stir within her regarding Terra. However, through the first batch of worlds, Aqua remains steadfast in her belief that light is inherently better than darkness, that it was stronger, better for the soul, and would lead the worlds to prosperity by its merit alone. Her mid-story twist would be in learning that Ericus didn't win the battle between him and Xehanort. See, she witnessed Ericus's maiming when he attacked Xehanort and was then told to run. After the battle, Ericus had told her that he'd won and driven Xehanort out, and that it was safe there. When she learns that Xehanort curb stomped Ericus, and that really he could have returned to finish the job whenever he wanted, she starts to heavily question Ericus as a teacher and a father. This doubt would lead to indecision, which would in turn contribute to the trio's falling out, when Terra would accuse her of shaming him for his use of dark powers, and claiming that nepotism between her and Ericus is the only reason that she's a master and he isn't. Basically, when she tries to convince them both to return to reform their family, Terra retaliates with, we were never your family. Ericus only choosing his true daughter as a master proves that before leaving. In the second batch of worlds, Aqua starts to seriously question her own reliance on the light, and starts to realize that she's been far too harsh in judging Terra for turning more and more away from it. Vanitas' improvement as a person also contributes to this, and by the time she meets up with the Wayfinder trio as a whole again, she's become much more humble, apologizing for her accusations and promising to do better in the future. She goes with Terra and Ventus back to the Land of Departure. At first, Ericus is proud of her for doing what he asked, but he becomes irritable when she tells him of the experience experiences she's had. He reprimands her for allowing Vanitas to roam freely, and grows even more so when Ventus reveals that he knows what he is. In a rage, and finally proving to Aqua what she'd begun to suspect, Ericus is consumed by the light, and attempts to eradicate Ventus so that the Kyblade can never be forged again. Terra intervenes to protect his friend, and Ericus orders Aqua to stop him. Disgusted by what her father has become, Aqua rips the pendant from her neck, drops it, and takes Ventus through a portal so Terra can fight Ericus. She, of course, resolves to mend things with him after things cool down and assuming he was willing to change, but of course that doesn't pan out because he's dead. The main motif that I wanted to add with the three characters is that they cast off a marker of their past. The armband from Terra's homeworld, the Keyblade Ventus got from Xehanort, and the pendant Aqua got from Ericus. All of these were discarded in favor of the Wayfinders that mark their connection to each other. And from there, the final battle happens. With everything now explained in a segregated manner, let's bring it all together, as well as add more details to the opening and ending scenes. Right at the start with the Mark of Mastery exam, there are changes. Xehanort isn't present. If you must have a second witness, have Yen Sid be there, so maybe Mickey can show up right at the start and have him be relevant there, instead of showing up halfway through Ventus' story for no reason. 
the orbs don't become steeped in darkness so Ventus doesn't have to fight. Then, when Aqua and Terra have to have their little duel, something major happens. The game will put its money where its mouth is. Terra uses the darkness willingly. Set up beforehand that he's been dabbling in it, but was never consciously able to summon its power until today. In game as it is now, Ericus even says something to the effect of one's true nature comes out when facing an equal, so it would fit. Terra, ecstatic that he's finally achieving this level of mastery, goes all in on the fight. Meanwhile, seeing the power that Terra is using, Aqua has all but frozen up, terrified of the darkness. After calming down, however, Aqua regains her fortitude and resolves to finish the fight. And in this canon, she loses. Cut to when Ericus reads the results. Aqua passes, and Terra fails. To Ericus's eyes, Terra gave in to his dark powers and failed to control both them and his competitive impulse, perhaps resulting in Aqua's serious injury through the fight. Meanwhile, Aqua managed to overcome her greatest weakness and see through to the finish despite her fear, showing that strength of heart. Disgruntled, Terra runs away as soon as he hears that Xehanort has gone off the radar in order to prove himself. Ventus runs after him. Now, would I keep that ridiculous Vanita scene? Maybe, but I would probably make it a dream sequence of some kind, which would partially excuse the surrealness of the interaction, as well as making Vanitas a bit more amicable. Never friendly, but less blunt and vitriolic. Ventus would then wake up, fearing that Terra would leave, and he does. Ventus then leaves, and Aqua has to go after him. Throughout the first batch of worlds, the trio encounter both each other and the unversed. Vanitas is, of course, releasing them into the worlds, but he doesn't know that yet. Remember, in this version, he's not even a year old. Xehanort probably sends him out to the worlds with the knowledge that Unverse would spread, thus giving both Ventus and Terra training and power to accomplish his own goals. But he likely wouldn't tell Vanitas that. He could have told Vanitas to go out and get stronger himself, or, you know, something along those lines. In any case, he runs into Terra first, and though Terra is confused as to who this boy is and why he can wield a Keyblade, and more so why he feels so much like Ventus, the two work together to defeat the Unversed. From there, he runs into Aqua and the two scuffle before the air is cleared and they also work together, etc. Meanwhile, the Wayfinder trio are meeting up with each other, even apart from Terra. Aqua could meet up with Ventus in the Castle of Dreams, with Terra in Dwarf Woodlands to take down the Evil Queen, and so on and so forth. Right before Radiant Garden, or soon into the world visits, each character Character gets their mid-story twist. Terra learns that Xehanort is responsible for the destruction of his homeworld, Ventus learns that he was originally Xehanort's pupil, not Ericus's, and Aqua learns that Ericus was curb stomped when he fought Xehanort and that he'd been lying about the light's inherent superiority to her. Throw Mickey in there somewhere, maybe running into the trio in their world visits, or at least making a more prominent appearance in the worlds than helping Ventus and Aqua with one fight each and then showing up at the final battles. The trio will then meet up and defeat the Trinity Armor Unversed, and then have their spat. Aqua orders Terra and Ventus to come home, only to hear Terra's mid-story twist, and learn of his desire for revenge. She tries to talk him out of it, saying that they're a family and that they should stick together. Terra counters that that wasn't really true, that Ericus was Aqua's only real family, and that was proven when she attained the rank of Master when Terra didn't, despite him being stronger than her. Savvy viewers will know that while Terra is wrong about this, Ericus was also in the wrong for failing him, creating a wonderful dissonance. Terra storms off, and even Ventus agrees with him, sadly proclaiming that he doesn't even know who he is or what kind of connection he has with them anymore, and leaves Aqua as well. Similarly to how Ventus is cheered up by Lee and Isa, I think it would be great for Vanitas to be the one to comfort Aqua, in his own way, perhaps under the guise of repaying a debt he accrued from her saving his ass when they met up in the Disney World before, or for sparing him when they fought, or you know, something like that. In any case, the trio go to their second batch of worlds and meet up with each other again. Slowly, the scars between them fade, and they start to regain their prior rapport. Vanitas really starts to form a connection with Terra and Aqua, viewing them as family just like Ventus does, and starts to grow jealous of Ventus and how much they care about him. Terra and Aqua come to an understanding, though not a complete reconciliation when they meet up. Aqua accepts Terra's quest for vengeance as something he needs to do to heal from his trauma, and Terra apologizes for losing control of his emotions and snapping at her and they part on okay terms. Ventus meets up with both and starts to reconcile his conflicted feelings over them, and eventually reaches the conclusion, perhaps with Mickey's help, that no matter what he remembers or not, Terra and Aqua both care about him like their own blood, and that he'd be a fool not to reciprocate that. 
After Terra's visit to Destiny Islands, where he gets a newfound resolve to repair the damage that's been done to the Wayfinder Trio's bond, he meets up with them, they fully reconcile with each other, and Terra displays this by casting off his armband, proclaiming that he's ready to move on if they walk beside him, which they agree to do. They go back to the Land of Departure, ready to call their adventure over, only for Ericus to go berserk. He tries to murder Ventus now that he has his memories and knows his purpose, and Terra protects him. Ventus leaves, and Aqua, disgusted, casts off the pendant Ericus gave her, throwing away her connection with him in favor of maintaining the one with the Wayfinder trio. Terra wields his dark powers and defeats Ericus's crushing light, but spares him, going against Xehanort's plans. Terra and Ericus have a heart-to-heart, -heart, and Ericus is so close to having a breakthrough, to realize the error of his ways and to want to mend the broken connection of their found family. Xehanort then strikes him down in his weakened state. Seeing his father figure and mentor murdered in front of him, Terra's vengeful fire is reignited, and he resolves to kill Xehanort in return. Meanwhile, Ventus and Aqua have a heart-to-heart, -heart, where Ventus casts off the Keyblade he received from Xehanort and forms one of his own, from his connection to the Wayfinder trio. Vanitas then appears, fully devolving into his identity crisis, and begs Aqua to take him instead of Ventus. Aqua refuses, though does offer Vanitas a place within the trio, which he refuses. In a rage, Vanitas kidnaps Aqua, whisking her off in a dark portal to the Keyblade Graveyard, telling Ventus to come there to fulfill his destiny. When Terra meets up with him, they go together, as Xehanort is likely to be there as well. Now don't worry, this isn't a case in the game proper where Aqua has to be saved by the big manly hero when she's knocked out like a bitch. Instead, Aqua just wakes up, maybe defends herself, and makes some distance to regroup from Xehanort and Vanitas, and then is found by Terra and Ventus not long after. Point is, she does not have to be rescued. That's like super important here. Instead, she just acted as the lore to get both of them there for Xehanort's plan to come to fruition. Much of the initial encounter happens as it does in the game, though much more of an emphasis is placed on just how out of their league their Wayfinder trio are, only for them to rally behind each other and slowly turn the tides. Terra is aided by Ventus and Aqua and makes it to fight Xehanort, while Aqua desperately tries to fight off Vanitas and prevent him from getting to Ventus, lest the Kyblade be forged. In case it wasn't obvious, we're cutting out the whole freezing bit with Ventus. That was stupid. In any case, Vanitas and his Unversed eventually overpower Aqua's attempt to ward them off, and he and Ventus merge. Vanitas acts as the dominant personality, and Aqua fights against him, wanting her friend back and chastising Vanitas for pretending to care all of this time. The irony being that he eventually did come to care about them, and that was why he was so hell-bent on making Ventus disappear, as they would always be vying for the attention of those they respect. Mickey also joins her and helps out. Meanwhile, the Terra fight plays out like normal, with Xehanort successfully taking over Terra's body. However, the lingering will does not rise to face him. Xehanort, maybe as a consequence of the body swap, suffers from temporary amnesia, and in a panic at the chaos around him, portals away to Radiant Garden. At this point, maybe in response to Ventus defeating Vanitas in his own heart, Vanitas' unversed go out of control, spawning an army, and Aqua and Mickey are close to losing. This is when the lingering will rises, not to satiate Terra's desire for revenge, but to protect and retrieve his friends. Here, we have a repeat of the Thousand Heartless cutscene, and in the end, it's a combination of Aqua, Mickey, and the Lingering Will, and Ventus defeating Vanitas in his heart, that purges Vanitas' conscious from Ventus' body and destroys the incomplete Kyblade. From there, Mickey and Aqua take Ventus' body to Yen Sid, and most of the rest plays out the same. Aqua finds Terra Xehanort in Radiant Garden and fights him, and you can do this one of two ways. Either she loses, paralleling the opening when she lost against Terra, or you could have some pathos with her whole I am Master Aqua thing, and then she wins, kind of subverting the opening when she lost against Terra. Either way, Aqua is cast into the Realm of Darkness, though she managed to do enough damage to give Terra Xehanort actual amnesia, leading to the rest of the series with everything in place as it was. Aqua does not sacrifice herself to save him, though. She just gets cast in maybe as a surprise attack or, you know, something else. Now, is this rewrite perfect? No. Off the top of my head, Terra's reasoning for using the darkness when his world was consumed by it is tenuous at best. But do I think it's better than the original? Absolutely. And I think that's the key takeaway from this. Me and my buddy Ian brainstormed all of that in about four hours total. It wasn't hard by any stretch, and it properly fleshed out the trio, giving them the unique family quality, proper character arcs, and gave much more weight to the final battles. And it's not like we even really need to go that far either. All of that that I just laid out was what I would do to rewrite Birth by Sleep, but not nearly all of those changes would be necessary to fix the broken narrative. Believe it or not, with all of my bitching and moaning in this video, I think that the Wayfinder trio have the highest potential out of any Kingdom Hearts characters, barring Axel and Roxas. 
they could have been so good. And there was so much setup for them and their story. And for this? To highlight just how close they were to greatness, here at the tail end of this analysis, I want to look at the opening movie for Birth by Sleep. It's hands down the best part of the game, and a strong contender for the best opening movie in the franchise, next to Sanctuary, and the orchestral Dream Drop Distance one. While some of it is reused footage from Kingdom Hearts 2's secret ending, the majority of it is original animation, and most of that is pretty great imagery and symbolism. The first shot we see of Aqua makes it appear like she's in a dive to the heart, only for us to zoom out and see that we're looking at her from Terra's perspective, framed against a stained glass window during their duel in the Mark of Mastery, with Terra on the ropes and Aqua in control. The first shot we see of Ventus is him looking back and seeing Xehanort and Vanitas, hinting at his connection to them, especially with Vanitas reaching out to Ventus in a visual callback to Riku doing the same for Sora in Kingdom Hearts 1's opening. Then we zoom into Vanitas' helmet and Ventus is in it, or perhaps it's a representation of that part of his heart, further hinting at the reveal of their connection. Ventus drops a blue heart which becomes becomes Aqua's Wayfinder, alluding to him running away from her throughout the whole game. And when all three Wayfinders shoot up, the trio is in the Keyblade Graveyard, or perhaps the crossroads featured in Chain of Memories. It's not exactly clear as they're very similar in appearance with this lighting. In any case, what follows is the most important shot that I want to talk about, when the Wayfinders turn into pedestals of Disney princesses from the dive to the heart. Terra's become Sleeping Beauty, Aqua's become Cinderella, and Ventus's become Snow White. Remember that, as we'll be discussing it shortly. In terms of original animation, we get very heavy implications about how Aqua feels about Terra, and then we get to the big money shot, with Terra and Ventus running away from a wall of darkness and light, respectively. Terra is running in a white hallway that resembles Castle Oblivion, perhaps hinting at how the Land of Departure becomes the castle in the final episode. Once we shift over to Ventus, we see what's missing. With Ventus, screens show all of the characters he meets and interacts with throughout the game, while Terra runs alone, alluding to him pushing away all of his friends in his pursuit of power. Terra is obviously running from the darkness inside of him, but Ventus is running from the light. Why? Well, because he's running from the truth, unwilling to remember his traumatic past with Xehanort and Vanitas. And from there, we get a whole bunch of reused footage and other stuff I don't care about. Okay, let's go back to the important shot, because this is really what I'm talking about. Now, could their choice in princess for each character be coincidence? Sure, and they definitely don't relate to who meets whom in-game, because nobody knows fucking anybody in-game, but let's really look at these. Sleeping Beauty is a story about a young person who was doomed by the machinations of an older evil person where in the end, they had no real choice in the bad things that happened to them. The evil person in question was diametrically opposed to the young person's guardian, while they were, in some ways, caught in the crossfire. Cinderella is a story where a young girl is given a golden opportunity due to her kindness. However, in the end, the events of the story don't center around the girl getting what she wants due to the newfound position she gains at the whims of a powerful person, but due to her own gentle soul. It's her kind heart that wins the love of the prince, not her dress or beauty. Snow White sees the main protagonist falling into an endless sleep due to the actions of someone that is jealous of their natural beauty and kindness, and so resents them for it. As well, the antagonist views himself as diametrically opposed to the protagonist, and that said protagonist shouldn't be allowed to exist while they're alive. Do any of these stories sound familiar with all that we've talked about in this video? Because it turns out that each story correlates to the member of the Wayfinder trio that is paired with them in the opening. Wow, how well thought out and nuanced to have your three main characters go through these tales as old as time. Except, this is Birth by Sleep. So yes, you could easily argue that Terra's story is a metaphor for the tale of Sleeping Beauty, but so what? Tons of stories follow the same story beats, and we don't give praise just because they do. We give praise for doing something with it. Given how all of these stories have a happy ending, and Birth by Sleep definitively doesn't, an easy solution would have been to just take everything to their darkest extreme. And to be fair, they have to do this with Terra. In Sleeping Beauty, Aurora was awoken by True Love's Kiss. In BBS, Aqua failed to get through to Terra after he was possessed by Xehanort, but they never really had a comparable connection as true love. Snow White was also awoken by True Love's Kiss, and she also had the friends she'd made along the way with the Seven Dwarves. Well, Ventus is put into a coma, even after he said, my friends are my power. What if, in his final moments, he actually renounces that power since it failed him? That would lead him into a really interesting direction come Kingdom Hearts 3, wouldn't it? Rather than him just having no character arc in that game. Cinderella may have a pure heart, but Aqua is, as established before, the biggest villain in the whole story, because she sets into motion the destruction of the world twice. She's also controlling and possessive of her friends, and she has an incredibly destructive black and white sense of morality that the game never punishes her for. 
If it did, if the game condemned Aqua because of her shallow ideals and did it often, then she would instantly become a more compelling character. But of course, we don't get anything of the sort. The setup is there, now we need to pay off. Birth by Sleep doesn't deliver the payoff. Never has, never will. And that's a real shame. And with that, I think we're done. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep is the worst entry in the series by far, and that's no exaggeration. There's absolutely nothing interesting here on any level, and anything new it introduces only serves to frustrate me as someone who cares about the series and its lore, a futile effort though that is. Unfortunately, this is going to be the norm for the rest of the series, as it focuses more and more on the machinations of Xehanort, and less and less on the emotional journeys of its main characters. Gone is the fun, witty dialogue, gone is the energy, and most importantly for me, gone is the near-flawless gameplay and balance of the prior entries. If I'm correct, and the rest of the series follows this pattern, then the original title of the video is apt. Darkness is the heart's true essence. The heart is where all things originate in the body, and this is where all of the other games in the series lead from narratively. And it's terrible. I can't possibly state my disappointment enough. Join me next time, where we'll dive into what many say is the craziest entry in the series, Dream Drop Distance, as well as briefly looking at 0.2. Thank you all for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. Until the end, my friends. See you soon.